I just want to welcome you here today, and uh, my name is Jonathan Quash. I'm the director of the York College Black Male Initiative Program, part of the City University of New York Black Male Initiative Program. It's so good to see all of you here today, and uh, we are delighted to uh, come before you today to present this Economic Empowerment Conference. Uh, this conference is the um, actually the first Economic Empowerment Conference that we've had uh, uh, in our series of events. We had a um, a symposium during our men's conference last September with uh, Ryan Mack, but, uh, but that was focused a little bit more on finance. And today we're dealing with the entrepreneurial spirit. As you know, the theme of today's conference is re-energizing our entrepreneurial spirit. And so we are hoping to, uh, well, we're gonna, I'm just gonna warn you now, you're gonna be set on fire by some of these, uh, uh, some of the speakers that we have here today. Um, before we begin, I just want to make a, uh, a couple of uh, quick, very quick announcements that, that, are, that are, I think, uh, important to us, particularly here on campus. Uh, on Thursday, April 29th, that is this Thursday at 12 noon, uh, we have the National Urban League is presenting their fifth annual Black Executive Exchange Program right here in the Performing Arts Center. Uh, they'll be visiting executives. They'll provide students with practical experiences that are needed to complete and complement their academic courses and help ambitious college students achieve success. And for those students who are interested, we do have, uh, we are asking that business attire is required and so that you do come dress for success. And I believe I saw uh, the director of that program is Chesney. But, um, but anyway, um, if you are able to, please come uh, out to that particular, to this particular event on this coming Thursday, 12 noon, at, uh, from 12 to 4, right here in the Performing Arts Center. I also want to um, announce that the, the legendary Theodore D. Young Community Center partners with Metro Hawks to show the dumb jock image is a myth. Uh, for years, American athletes have fought against the idea that they are not as intelligent as, as everyone else. Young athletes have long been fighting the same stigma. Dr. William J. McCarthy, along with his colleagues at the University of California in Los Angeles, showed with a recent study that students who are physically fit score significantly higher on tests than those less fit. With this in mind, the Theodore Young Community Center and the Metro Hawks Athletic Club is co-sponsoring a youth pool play basketball tournament dedicated to the pursuit of excellence in sports and education. Boys ages 17 and under will compete in this tournament at the cost of $450 per team. Uh, and the tournament will be held at the Theodore Young Community Center, which is in White Plains, 32 Manhattan Avenue, White Plains. If you are interested in that particular event, that's going to be uh, June 25th through the 27th. Please, please do uh, come and see me afterwards, and I'd like to make sure you um, get that information. Um, we're going to start out today with a special presentation uh, by City Limits. We're so delighted today to have uh, Mr. Walter Fields, who is the publisher of City Limits magazine, uh, and he's going to come at this time in his own way and make a special presentation regarding the Black Depression. Good afternoon. I'm not going to take up a lot of time because I'm interested to hear what this esteemed panel has to say. I have a lot of old friends here, a lot of new friends, so I'll only take a couple of minutes. City Limits Magazine is a 35-year-old uh, magazine and website, citylimits.org, which focuses on public policy issues in New York City, particularly issues of concern to low and moderate income New Yorkers. Um, I became publisher in November after the Community Service Society of New York where I served as Vice President for Government Relations, acquired City Limits from another not-for-profit organization. What we're attempting to do with City Limits is really focus on issues that are important to the city, but also important to communities that have remained voiceless for some time. Our May edition of City Limits magazine, which you can receive outside, we have a table set up, a young lady, Shirley Coley, um, is sitting behind the table, and you can get a copy of our May issue. It's called The Black Depression, and it really talks about black male joblessness in New York City. Now, we've all heard about high unemployment rates. What we're talking about is something a little different. Joblessness means that you are completely severed from the labor market. And it's such an epidemic um, in New York City that we stand to have generations of black men 
who will never, ever work. That's how bad it is. So we decided to dedicate our entire May issue to this subject. And I don't like to dwell in a lot of statistics because one of the things that I point out in my publisher's page, the time for talking about this stuff is over. What we really need is some action. Uh, we've had enough research reports. We've had enough analysis. We can see brothers in every community, every income level have been affected. This isn't an issue that only affects poor black men or middle income black men. It has really devastated our community across the board. So what we really need is action. But I'm going to give you a couple of statistics just to put this problem into some context. In 2004, there was a study that revealed that whites with criminal records were 50% more likely to get a job call back than blacks with a criminal record. But even more so, white ex-offenders were more likely than blacks with no criminal record at all to get a call back on a job. And I cite this because we need to understand that there are some structural issues preventing black men from working. They include education, they include training, there are some physical disability issues, there's actually some mental health issues, and we know that a large percentage of black men have touched the criminal justice system, so it becomes difficult to get a job once you have a criminal record. But even with all that, we also know that race and discrimination continue to play a predominant role in determining opportunities for black men. And I say that because for too long we've run away from that issue. We've run away from that conversation. And we need to put it out there out front because unless we do, there will be a mountain of excuses why black men aren't being hired. There are certain no work zones in New York City where communities have such high joblessness rates that pretty much there's no work going on among black men. I'll give you a couple of examples. In West Brooklyn, the black unemployment rate for, for black men is 46%. 46%, almost half of all black men don't have a job. And I can guarantee you a large percentage of the half that does are underemployed, meaning that they're working, but their wages are so low that they can't support themselves or their families. In Southeast Queens, it's 22%. In Central Brooklyn, it's 23%. Now, we know that, you know, 39 uh, a third quarter of 2009, the black unemployment rate was 19.9% compared to 7.6% for white males. That's according to the Fiscal Policy Institute, which is a progressive public policy think tank that does a lot of work in Albany around budget issues. But we also know that 22% uh, of black men in New York City don't possess a high school diploma. That's compared to 15% of white males. So we begin to see a number of issues uh, that result from this problem, this pandemic that we're having in our community. What I think we need to focus on are several things. Number one, education policy. Um, I'm always amazed in New York City that folks aren't angrier than they are, particularly parents of the state of public education in New York City. And I think it's particularly important for the African American community to step up to the plate and begin to be heard about the education of their children. The second issue is workforce development. What type of training mechanism is in place to make people, to give people the skills that are necessary to become employable? The criminal justice system, whether it's law enforcement, judiciary, or corrections, we know that a lot of black men end up being arrested for wrong reasons. We also know that in the judiciary, they often get jail sentences because they don't have proper legal representation. And then once incarcerated, we know that the recidivism rate is high because there is no education at all going on in correctional facilities and that when individuals are released, their chances of being employed are zero to none. Labor, we need to have a frank conversation with labor unions in the construction trades. Even though there's been some improvement, you can still drive by construction sites in New York City and not see a black or brown face. That's unacceptable. Immigration, we need to understand that you know, we can't get in a fight with immigrants. In my estimation, the battle isn't over whether they have a job or we have a job, it's whether there's a job there that pays a decent wage so that people can support themselves. We shouldn't get caught up in this notion that it's us against them. Guess what? It's them against all of us. So we need to keep that in perspective. And the last piece is 
economic development. We have conversations in the city about economic development, and we're not only not in the room, we're not in the building, we're not in the block, we're not in the neighborhood, we're not in the borough. Decisions are made every day about how this city is being developed, and we are completely absent. And the only fault is ours, because we allow that to happen. So I encourage you to pick up City Limits Magazine, go on our website at citylimits.org. I believe the role of my news organization is to be the clarifying voice that brings some clarity to these incredibly tough issues. But at the end of the day, we can write and report and talk all we want. What we really need are advocates who are willing to take a position. For too long, we've had drive-by advocacy in New York City where folks basically see a situation, they say a few words, and they move on to the next thing. We need some real advocates again because our community is suffering. As this issue will tell you, our black men are being destroyed with no opportunity, and our children have no hope. So I wanna thank you for the opportunity to talk with you a little bit about this problem, and I hope you'll pick up our magazine when you get a chance in the lobby. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Fields, and, and uh, I do encourage each of us to go, if, if at all possible, to visit the lobby. In addition to that at the table outside, I just want to mention, too, that the one of our um, sort of partners in the Mail Initiative Program, as I mentioned before, Mr. Ryan Mack, has also prepared a financial workbook of sorts, which is on the table outside. So if you have not picked one of those up, it's from Optimum Capital Management. So if you have not picked one of those up, please, by all means, do. If you know uh, any friends, relatives, neighbors, or whatever that you'd like to give those to, please uh, pick up several. We have plenty of them for you, so if you want to take you know, several of them, we encourage you to do so because it is a tremendously valuable workbook. Uh, it really does help and it makes a lot of, a lot of concrete uh, points about uh, economics with respect to savings and things like that. Uh, we have a special presentation now uh, representing the Commissioner of HRA and it's going to be Mr. Raymond Singleton. Good evening. Uh, very honored to be here today, and uh, I'm very honored to be uh, present among these esteemed panelists. Uh, I, um, I was asked to present to you today on behalf of uh, Mayor Bloomberg and Commissioner Robert Doerr, uh, the Human Resources Administration. Uh, again, my name is Ray Singleton. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Employment Services there. Uh, you all are probably familiar with the Human Resources Administration in New York City and know that uh, the agency is one of the largest social service agencies uh, in the nation, providing services for people who are in receipt of public assistance, applying for public assistance, and moving towards employment. Uh, so our message is, is very simple, it's very clear. Uh, our message is that people, if they can go to work, should go to work. Uh, and then we have support services to wrap around uh, when folks finally make that, that leap into the labor market. One of the things that I guess I was impressed to hear was uh, uh, the gentleman that spoke before me who uh, is overseeing the City Limits uh, magazine. I'd heard him mention the uh, unemployment rate and upwards of 45% of uh, men, men of color, who are not working in New York City is an alarming rate. Uh, the unemployment rate is 10%, and in certain boroughs, especially the Bronx and Brooklyn, that unemployment rate can rise up to 20 some odd percent. And for youth, young, young black youth and one, uh, young Latino youth, it can be even worse. And I would, I would think, uh, as he was saying, that folks would be a lot more ingrained in what's going on in the community and pushing uh, programs that are guiding not only the youth, but even folks who are out of work and out of the labor market to get involved in employment programs, to get involved in training programs that help connect people to employment. Then also to think about family formation programs because uh, one of the things that we know of is that if people are engaged in their family, they're motivated to go to work, they're motivated to do things, uh, not only for themselves, but also for their communities. Uh, so just to give you a quick overview of what goes on at HRA, uh, underneath my domain, there are about five different employment programs that touch every borough in New York City. Uh, we have workforce development programs that 
provide employment services to people who are trying to connect back to the labor market. One of the things that we think is best is that people should give an effort to test the labor market and to go to work. And so no matter what your skill set is, no matter where you're at, no matter where you think you are uh, in being competitive in the labor market, we would like to encourage people to try out the labor market, go get a job, see what happens when you're working, and then you can have a good assessment of what you need to do to increase your competitiveness in the labor market. So the programs we manage push work, right? And that means that we make opportunities available by developing jobs with employers who are willing to give people that opportunity. Once people connect to those jobs, we wrap around training services to them. Uh, we've initiated an electrician's training program with CUNY colleges, Hostos uh, is part of that partnership. City Tech is a part of that partnership. Uh, we certainly would love to have your college, if they were interested, uh, think about programs that they can provide that helps put people and connect them to jobs. Uh, this electrician's training program focuses on connecting people to opportunities where wages are uh, livable wages, uh, where people can get engaged in work and uh, bring home uh, money that we think is family supportive money. Through programs like that, uh, what we've tried to do is work with community colleges, CUNY schools, uh, that offer people opportunities not only within the school system, but those people who are outside the school system who are trying to get connected. Now, let me just uh, sort of say two quick things. Uh, one of the things that we try to focus on with folks who are in our system is trying to move men to employment. Uh, we have programs that we push child support, uh, and we try to help people who owe child support to understand that child support is one workaround or one work support uh, that can help people sort of support the whole family. So I know that's not positive uh, uh, in some respects. People sort of dodge the bullet when it comes to child support. Uh, but what we've done is try to make child support uh, a way that people can live, uh, work, and make payments to their family so that there's a family formation principle. One of the things that we do, and I think it's important for people to understand, if somebody's avoiding work because they have child support payments, we have a program that reduces the arrears uh, that men, particularly non-custodial parents, might owe so that they can continue to go to work or think about going to work and reducing the arrears or eliminating the arrears where we can all together. And so in this program, people don't have to avoid going to work or avoid paying child support. They actually can get engaged in the labor market and make an effort to be a more productive part and stable part of the family by contributing to uh, making payments and being a productive and uh, helpful part of that child's life. So one, one thing that we're pushing to try to help men go back to work are modified uh, arrears programs that help people connect to work where they're not paying high arrears for child support uh, and they also can continue to work and make appropriate payments while they're doing that. Uh, another program that we started to work with with the Brooklyn DA's office uh, is helping folks who were formerly incarcerated. So if folks have been formerly incarcerated, a program called Calm Alert in Brooklyn uh, works with HRA to try to connect folks uh, who are going through that process back to employment. Uh, we work with people who are in receipt of cash assistance, food stamps, uh, and people who are applying for services. Once connected, we connect people to the training program. Those training programs provide services that get people connected to immediate jobs and maintenance. Uh, again, in that electrician's program, if we can get them in there. We work with the CEO on that particular initiative. Uh, and again, into regular labor market jobs where folks can be successful. Uh, and then finally, we're working with, and you probably have heard of, uh, some of the New York City Parks Department programs. Uh, and in that effort, we're working with what we call subsidized jobs. Subsidized jobs allow us an opportunity to put people to work, uh, immediately put people to work right away. And what we do in that effort is we work with employers uh, and say to employers that if they're hiring people, we can help reduce their costs for their upfront wages. And what we do is we ask employers to consider taking people who they might not normally uh, take in, in their regular hiring scheme, but to work with us to hire people who are formerly incarcerated or people who might not have that certain skill development or that skill piece that they need to be successful. And then we work with that employer and the training provider while that person is on that subsidized job uh, so that they can continue to develop the skills. And hopefully after the subsidy is over, the employer will uh, hire this person and roll them over into a regular job. And the subsidized job program, the agency has received about $25 million. Uh, we have doled out uh, at least 75% of that money into the private sector labor market. 
and have probably uh, rolled up about maybe 2,000 jobs so far uh, where we've connected people to work, we've subsidized the wages for employment, and we think that these are opportunities where people might not have been as competitive for jobs, but the employers allowed them, or at least worked with us, to help people connect to jobs immediately because we were modifying those costs up front. Uh, so these are some fairly, fairly decent programs uh, that help people get to the labor market quickly. Uh, again, I think what we're you know, trying to present here at the, at the forum is that we want to help people make the connection to the labor market, and, and HRA's goal ultimately is to connect people to immediate employment. Uh, and so our goal is certainly work and supports and where we could be a more productive part of this panel and even more productive part of programs that you got going forward. Uh, we certainly would love to be able to connect uh, the training programs that we have, our employment programs through uh, the vendors that are throughout some of the boroughs in New York City uh, and even through our parks program. Uh, to commemorate the event, I have a letter here from the mayor's office uh, to York College. And it says that uh, CUNY forms an invaluable network of support for its students and alumni uh, when it's focused on re-energizing our entre entrepreneurial spirits. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Singleton. I really appreciate those remarks. And uh, HRA has a special place in my heart, actually, because my mother used to be deputy commissioner. Uh, she retired in 1997, but uh, I, um, I appreciate that. And I know uh, Ms. Chesney is listening attentively because uh, we really would like to have some further conversations with you. I know I would. Um, and so our next speaker, we're going to get into our speakers now uh, who are here today coming from various different perspectives and different backgrounds. And so we want to give them the opportunity to present to you and to encourage and inspire, inform, enlighten. And I know all of them are going to do that. But our, the first of our uh, panelist speakers is Mr. Harry Wells. Mr. Harry Wells is the director of the York College Small Business Development Center. He has over 20 years experience in international trade and economic development, entrepreneurship, and small business management. Mr. Wills has consulted on World Bank projects and also with private American companies on developing the manufacturing and exporting potential for southern and West African countries. In his current position, he has counseled hundreds of entrepreneurs and assisted in their obtaining millions of dollars in financing for business startup and expansion. In 2007, he authored 10 successful startups, how their setbacks, management strategies, and practical lessons can help you succeed in business. And we are certainly delighted to have him here today. He's going to come now in his own way, Mr. Wells. Hello, everybody. I'd like to thank you for coming. I'd like to thank Jonathan and his people for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to be here. First, I'd like to do is recommend a book for you guys. Have you guys ever heard of a book called Black Titan, The Life of A.G. Gaston? Get that book. Because we're talking about entrepreneurial spirit. We're talking about uh, uh, revitalizing entrepreneurial spirit. A.G. Gaston was a man who was born in 1892, died in 1992, lived almost 100 years, started out by selling sandwiches, ended up his net worth was $140 million. When you get that book, the introduction talks about the legacy of black entrepreneurship in America. It goes back to the time of Booker T. Washington. He was a follower of Booker T. Washington. It talks about black banks in the, black banks in the 1800s, black businesses. We had a lot of things going. We had Black Wall Street in Tulsa, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. A lot of things that happened to us were destroyed. A lot of things we built was destroyed by white racism, white terror. So please get that book. Uh, I had a client in my center, a Jamaican lady. She never heard of A.G. Gaston. I told her to read the book. She read the book and she made her whole family buy the book. And she called it her business, uh, a business Bible. In the book, A.G. Gaston talks about his following Booker T. Washington and everything he built. He started off with fume plots, then fume homes, real estate, etc. So he was the richest black man in America. He was based in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. 
A fascinating part of that book is his, his relationship with Dr. King during the Birmingham marches. King was more for political action. He was more for economic development. It kind of goes back to the debate between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Well, at the end of the book, King ended up investing in his company, and he ended up joining the picket line. So there was no line of, uh, thick line of demarcation between direct action and economic development. But it really kind of really uh, shows his relationship with King when the hotel was bombed in Birmingham where King was staying. He owned that hotel, and he put his, his, put his uh, mouth where his, he put his mouth behind him. When he got ready to retire, he owned the insurance company. He, it was worth, the market value was 20, $25 million. He sold it to his employees so he could create a whole group of black professional people. So there is a line, there is a river, there is a long winding road of black entrepreneurship. It started uh, before Booker T. Washington but Booker T. Washington, then it goes to Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey came to this country to meet Booker T. Washington. And he was a follower. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad was a, uh, was a member of Marcus Garvey's group. So black entrepreneurship has a long history. I grew up in Texas. As a kid, I'm getting old, I was born in a black hospital. I, uh, we had black supermarkets. We had black businesses all over the place. Somehow we lost that. We have to get that back. Now, uh, also there's an international dynamics to this. In the introduction, they talked about me being in Southern Africa. When I was in Namibia in 1988, I kept meeting all these older African men named Marcus. Marcus this, Marcus that. So finally, a light went off. I should ask, I said, why are so many of you people named Marcus? They say, because we were waiting for Marcus Garvey to come to Africa so we all could be liberated. So, you know, you have, we have to know our history. That's very important. The York College SBD, SBDC, I've been with it for about 10 years. I've been the director only for a year. What we do is that we help people. You come to us, we're financed by the SBA, there's no charge if you come. We help you with your business plan. We help you do your marketing plan. We help you do market research. But our main forte is helping you find money. Through SBA financing, we can get you anywhere from $5,000 to $2 million. So we help people get business loans. We've been here for 21 years. We're located in the science building. It's, not too, it's like three buildings over from here. So if you need any help in the technical system, come to us because we have qualified MBAs. You have people like myself with business experience who will sit down and work with you. You can come one time or you can come 100 times. It's never any cost to you. Also, we have the global SBDC. A lot of people don't know it, but you know, the SBDC, you, you may not know about the SBDC, but it's growing, growing internationally. We have 25 branches in Mexico. We have people coming from Africa who want to uh, em emulate the SB SBDC model. So we're talking to countries in Brazil. We're talking to all kind of different countries about entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is very important throughout Africa right now. I would tell any young person, if I was young again, I probably would move to Africa because a lot of opportunities you get, you can get in Africa, you can never get anywhere in the world as a black person. I was in Namibia and I met this uh, hillbillies from Texas, from my hometown of Dallas. Yeah, they were hillbillies and they, they perfected the whole thing of getting diamonds from the ocean. And now they're multi-billionaires. So a lot of our people say, oh, I don't want to go to Africa. Hey, if I had to do it over, I would start out as a young man and go back and forward between Africa and America. And I would really try to make some, some, some gigantic uh, advances in life. I quit my business. I had to sell my business 
because, because my wife passed away, so I couldn't really travel anymore, and I had two, two daughters to raise. So being an, being an entrepreneur, I was in college. I was working on my graduate degrees. I decided to jump out there and open my own business. The first thing I did, I lost $50,000. It took me three years to get it back. So there's some important lessons to being an entrepreneur. If, you're going, if you want to make the journey, journey to be an entrepreneur, you have to realize it's not going to be overnight. The average entrepreneur fails three times before they become successful. So when you, when you fail, and you, when you fail and then things don't go right for you, the thing is to pick yourself up and learn the lessons and move forward. I, I, I used to sublet from a guy named Frank Maya. He made millions of dollars in Nigeria. At 50 years old, he had to declare a bankruptcy. He analyzed his mistakes, started over again. By the time he was 70 years old, he was a multimillionaire again. So you're going to fail. The average entrepreneur fails three times. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, you don't learn by an entrepreneur by just going to classes. You learn entrepreneurship in the streets. You can study, but you have to get out there, as I said, get knocked down, clean yourself up, and move forward. That's very important. Also, to be an entrepreneur, you have to be a visionary. I have a client right now. His name is Patrick. He dropped out of high school in eighth grade. From the time he's 62 to he's 70 years old now, he started importing fabrics from China. Excuse me, he started importing uh, apparel from China. Now he's doing a $70 million a year business. And he always tells me, it's never, you're never too old. If you want to start at 60, you can start at 60. If you want to start at 25, you can start at 25. He also said that if he was a young man, he would just move to China. Because there are a lot of international opportunities out, he out here right now. So it's very important that you have to be a visionary. Another important thing to be an entrepreneurship is you need to have a mentor. You need somebody who you could discuss things with, who's had, who has more practical experience with, than you, so someone can really mentor you so you can understand your mistakes. So I think having a mentor is very important. Another important lesson is that if you're going to start a business, start it in a high growth area. We have too many restaurants. I know you walk down, I live in Brooklyn. You walk down a block in Brooklyn, they got 15 restaurants, and they're all say, selling the same food. So let's look for some, some good opportunities where there's high growth. I think this Friday, we're having an international trade breakfast where uh, Congressman Gregory Meeks is going to speak. And we're t President Obama is talking about doubling U.S. export. So I think export is a high growth area. And exporting doesn't mean just product, it could mean services. So I think there are a lot of excellent opportunities, opportunities for people who are like uh, consultants, people who are accountants, people in financial services. So if you get a chance, come to our breakfast and later on make an appointment so you could come over and see me and we could talk about international, the international marketplace. Another important high growth area, I think, and it gets back to uh, Booker T. Washington, the construction industry. In Queens and in Brooklyn, they're having big, massive development projects. Uh, they have in Brooklyn, the Atlantic Yard, Yard Stadium. Here, they have Willis Point. These are billion dollar projects, five, six billion dollar projects. So through the elected officials and people like Reverend Daughtry, they have negotiated and said 20% of all these contracts have to go to minority and women. So I think construction, Booker T. Washington always talked about trades. Trades is very important. I have a client now, his name is Ashley. He's in my book. He did $4 million a year. He's doing $4 million a year now, and he hasn't been to school since he was 14 years old. So to address this issue of construction, 
We're starting, turn, we've joined with Turner Construction Company. Starting July 1st, we'll have courses here on construction management. It's open for people who are already in the field as contractors. It's also open for students. So think about that, because I think that if you can get in and get some of these high growth con contracts, one thing I learned in business, little money leads to big money. In some, of these, in some cases, these could be very big, big contracts. So I know I'm, I'm rushing because I, I have, a, have a limited time. So please try to come to our Turner construction classes. If you have any information, there's a flyer on the outside that deals with the international trade breakfast, international area. Turner Construction, you could call my office, 718-262-2880, and we can give you further information about that. Okay, so those are the lessons of business. What do you have to do? What do you need to do to get yourself a business? First, you have to person, personally empower yourself. You can't open a business when you're broke. This brother here talked about employment. Hey, when people come to me and say, I want to go into business or keep my job, blah, de, blah, de, blah, I say, first of all, keep your job. Because you can't start a business when you're broke. So find ways to save money. Save at least $5,000, $10,000 so you can have money in the bank. As I say, you can come to us and we can get you loans anywhere from five to two, five thousand to two million dollars. But why do you want to pay all this interest if you don't have to? So one of the first things you have to do in, in terms of empowering yourself is that you need to start saving money. You need to correct your credit score. All the loans you get from, from us you need at least a 680 credit score. So if you have bad credit, that's no shame. I had bad credit one time. When my wife was sick, she had cancer, and I was dealing with her, my credit got bad. So I had to go through credit repair. So, you know, that's life's, you know, life gives us a lot of different things we have to go through. So empower yourself, get your credit straight now. That's very important. That's, that's a very important uh, subject. Also, you need to learn the language of business. Before you go into business, don't do like me. Don't be cocky. I say, oh, this is easy for me. I got a master's degree. And then I lost my money. My wife almost kicked me out the crib too, right? So take classes at York. Go to continuing ed. Take bookkeeping classes. Take basic accounting classes. Because in business, if you don't know how to handle your money, if you don't know how to control your costs, I guarantee you would have some setbacks. One of my clients, he's here from Queens, he was selected by uh, a big business magazine, by Cranes Magazine, as the Entrepreneur of the Year. We went to a big celebration, they gave him a big award and all that. Two weeks later, the internal revenue hit him up. He had a $100,000 lien, $100,000 lien because he wasn't paying his taxes. When he went to his accountant to find out what was happening, his accountant bailed on him. He couldn't find his accountant. So you have to empower yourself and you have to learn the language of business because if you don't, you don't let nobody else control your money. In business, they say, don't get too far away from you and your money. As I uh, wind up now, I think I might have gone over my 15 minutes. I just like to say, being an entrepreneur can be very rewarding. As I said, the first thing you have to do is, is really get yourself together. The SBDC, the SBA, we can get you a lot of money, but if you have back child support, we can't do nothing for you. So man up on your kids. I raised two daughters by myself. So if you're not dealing with your kids, I can't, I can't, I, I can't get that. I cannot grasp someone not dealing with their children. So, you know, get, get caught up. Get your money together. Get your uh, finances together. And take care of all your responsibilities. And the last point i like to say, making money is one thing. But even if you're making money and you're a miserable person, what's the point? You have a lot of rich fools. You have a lot of, I, I hate this. 
I went to college with O.J. Simpson. We were on the football team together. I might be broke or broker than he was, but I ain't in jail. I enjoy my life. <laughs> yeah. So have a good life. Have a good life. Take care of your kids. We're only here once. So if you want to start a business, start with something that you love to do. Start with something you love to do. And make sure that when it's all over and you close your eyes to the creator, you can say, hey, I enjoy it every day. My wife passed at 38. I understand about that. So let's try to live a good life, to take care of our kids, and come to the York College SBDC. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Wells. It was wonderful. And it's OK if you go over. It's all right. It was all very important and very necessary information. And uh, we really appreciate that. I didn't know you went to school with OJ. <laughs> yeah, about 100 years ago. Oh, OK. Well, all right. Uh, our next speaker, we are so delighted to have with us today our next presenter, uh, Mr. Kevin Powell, who is widely considered one of America's leading political and cultural voices in these early years of the 21st century. He's a longtime activist and award-winning writer. Powell was born and raised in Jersey City, New Jersey, and is the product of a single mother-led household, extreme poverty, fatherlessness, and violence. In spite of these harsh circumstances, he has studied at Rutgers University in New Jersey and has become one of the most prolific and respected writers and leaders of his generation. He is the author and editor of 10 books, including his newest, Open Letters to America, a collection of essays that examines American leadership, politics, and various social issues in the era of Barack Obama. And I will say that we at the Men's Center, we actually use Mr. Powell's book as our handbook. His uh, black male handbook is a fantastic piece. If you do not have it or do not uh, know it, you, you definitely uh, need to get it because it is a f tremendous book. We use this for all incoming freshmen that enter our program, and it is an awesome book. Uh, additionally, Mr. Powell's writings have appeared in a range of publications, including the Washington Post, Newsweek, Essence, Ebony, Esquire, Rolling Stone, and Vibe magazine, where he was a senior writer for several years, documenting most famously the life and times of the late Tupac Shakur. As an activist, Mr. Powell has worked on a range of concerns, including voter registration, Hurricane Katrina relief, education, the environment, and eradicating poverty. As an extension of his activism work, Mr. Powell also routinely does college, corporate, and community lectures across America and internationally. And he is a frequent presence on television and radio, offering his commentary on a range of issues, including on The Oprah Winfrey Show, where he was a part of the national conversation on domestic violence and how men can help to end the assault on women and girls. Powell is not only a writer and activist, but also a business owner. And he has a particularly keen interest these days in community development and incubating small and medium-sized American businesses. Finally, a longtime and proud resident of Brooklyn, New York, Kevin Powell is currently a Democratic candidate for Congress in Brooklyn. And I would say that if you can, please at all, of those of you who are uh, uh, supportive of our politicians, that we need to make sure this young man uh, becomes elected. He's and I received in the news today that he's raised just over 85000 in just four weeks. And so uh, we, he has a little ways to go. We want to continue to support him as much as possible. I will make his website available to you in a few minutes. Uh, but, but we would love to really uh, make sure we see him as Congressman Kevin Powell the next time he's here. Let us give Mr. Kevin Powell a hand as he comes. Good, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. We're awake. I, I think first and foremost, well, first and foremost, I want to thank God for this opportunity. Amen. Amen. I want to, uh, and I'm never so religiously arrogant to assume everyone in the room is a Christian. If you're a Muslim, if you're Jewish, if you practice some other faith, uh, I just hope we all have some sort of spiritual or moral compass that guides us. Amen. Amen. I want to uh, uh, personally and publicly acknowledge Mr. Wells, and I think we should give him another round of applause because that was just a a wealth of information. 
And in the tradition that I come out of, and my mother coming from South Carolina, number one, but also out of the tradition of being an activist for now 26 years since I was a teenager, we always uh, uh, follow our elders and, and, and pray, give respect to our elders. I just wanted to say thank you for those, uh, that brilliant history lesson. I appreciate that. I want to certainly acknowledge all the esteemed speakers here. Uh, I can't wait to hear everyone else speak. I could just sit here. Can you all just, just feel what I'm feeling? Just take all of this in because this is great information. And uh, I'm honored, uh, Mr. Quash, thank you for inviting me and for the kind introduction. And certainly York College. I have not been here in a couple of years, so it's good to be back. I want to be as, as, as brief as possible and as quick as possible, uh, but I love this theme, re-energizing our entrepreneurial spirit. And I want to share just a couple of things with you all really quickly. Uh, as Mr. Quash said in uh, my, my introduction, my, I'm the product of a single mother-led household. Um, I haven't seen my father since uh, in 35 years, since I was a little boy. My mother uh, had a great school education. She literally raised me on welfare, food stamps, government cheese. Y'all remember government cheese? And the kind of poverty I wouldn't wish on anyone. When I was growing up, I thought it was normal to have rats and roaches all over your home. I thought it was normal not to have hot water or heat in the wintertime. But what I say when I think about this entrepreneurial spirit, I realize that the first financially literate person that I ever met in my life, the first entrepreneur actually met in my life was my mother. And I'll tell you why. The 18 years that I spent her household until I went away to college, to Rutgers University, New Jersey, my mother understood that if she didn't make ends meet, y'all with me for a second, right? You know, imagine Rake making eight, nine, ten thousand dollars a year raising a child by yourself, but having to go to the corner deli and ask them for a dollar's worth of bologna, knowing you have to save that for a whole week. Are y'all out there with me? And so when you talk about an entrepreneurial spirit, I agree that we should look in our history. I was so moved by uh, uh, things that Dr. Wells was saying because there's a straight line from Booker T. Washington to Demarcus Garvey to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Nation of Islam. And so all we got to do is look in our history to find examples of, of entrepreneurial spirit. But I also say that we should not skip over our own families who, as they were living and surviving and winning against all odds, were teaching us how to be entrepreneurial as well. A couple things uh, saved my life that I, I feel is the reason why I'm standing here. One, my mother, and God, my mother, education, education, education. I cannot stress to you how important it is, particularly the students here, and education is. We should never take that for granted. And I'm talking about not only learning how to read and write and do arithmetic, but also the kind of education I'm thinking about, which speaks to the point that Mr. Fields was talking about in his brilliant presentation. I got to acknowledge Walter, he's been doing this work for a long time, and we appreciate you as well, uh, is that before you can own anything, you got to own yourself. You got to own yourself. Well, what do I mean by that? I mean that you got to know who you are. You know, and since we're talking about people of color here for a second, let me make it clear. I love all people. I'm a human being. I love all people. But for a second, I grew up with blacks and Latinos, African-Americans, West Indians, Puerto Ricans, and Dominicans. Those are my people. And so when I talk about own yourself, if you don't know who you are, if you don't know your history, if when Mr. Wells was talking about Booker T and Marcus Garvey, Tulsa, Oklahoma, well, I was just in Tulsa last week, and I'm here to tell you there was a section called Greenwood. There was a black Wall Street where there was a doctor's office and dentists and newspapers and insurance companies. There was every kind of institution you can imagine that was there. And of course, we hear the stories about how that community was destroyed by white terrorists, because it was, but the story that's often left out, as was told to me by the folks in Tulsa, is don't forget that they rebuilt parts of that community. What ended up destroying black businesses in places like Tulsa, Oklahoma, and around the country was something called integration, where we began to think that someone else's Kool-Aid or lemonade stand was better than our Kool-Aid or lemonade stand. Are y'all with me out there for a second? And so when we talk about the entrepreneurial spirit, I feel that a lot of the lessons are all in our history. And if we're ever going to get our people fully employed again, it's not going to come from government programs per se. It's not going to come from getting a job somewhere else. It's going to come from the opportunities we create for ourselves. My brother Chuck D., founding member of Public Enemy, said that the only time that black folks, specifically black men, have ever been fully employed in this country was during slavery. I want you all to think about that for a second, during slavery. So if I could bring it back for a second to mama, when I was a little boy, 
One of the things that my mother said to me is that you've got to learn how to work. So from the time I was seven or eight years old, you better believe I was at the corner at the grocery store bagging groceries. She's like, you got to do this. You better believe that I was selling newspapers in my communities. You better believe by the time I was 12, 13 years old, I was delivering groceries around my neighborhood. You better believe I had a summer job because of government programs that were created by people who were advocates during times like the Civil Rights Movement that said we've got to create opportunities for our young people who come from the kind of environment I came from, which was extreme, again, poverty. It was because elected officials and our leaders understood that we've got to demand that we give our young people something to do in the summer because if you do not, guess what's going to happen to them? And we see all the mayhem happening in our communities. Brooklyn is out of control. Queens is out of control. Uptown's out of control because most of our young people don't know where to go for jobs, opportunities, and the people who call themselves leaders are too busy taking care of themselves. They've abandoned the whole generation of young people. What we got to do, is be advocates for our young people. The way my mother was an advocate for me. Go to school. This is why you need to go to school. This is why you got to work. But we got to take it a step further, and we also have to teach our young people who they are so that when they do get money, they don't make the mistake that I made when I was a teenager. And when I went to college, I put all my money into video games, you know, because my self-esteem was low because I didn't know who I was as a black person, as an African person. And so my self-esteem was tied to the sneakers I had, to what kind of clothes I had, and I'm ashamed to admit it when I used to put gold fronts in my mouth. I mean, imagine the things that we spend money for. And you can go to any community in New York City, be it Jamaica Avenue here in Queens, or 125th Street in Harlem, or Flatbush and Fulton in Brooklyn, they sell the same junk in every hood in America. And what I say to people now in my communities, how many North Face jackets do we actually need? How many pairs of Timberlands do we actually need? How many basketball sneakers do we actually need? But you'll never have an entrepreneurial spirit if your self-esteem and your self-worth is not about where you came from, your history, your people, your culture, your traditions, but it's tied to this material thing that can easily be discarded. So when you see many of our people having bad debt, not because of a, an emergency like Mr. Wells' wife having cancer and God bless her soul, but because people simply have been fiscally illiterate their entire lives, and I was one of them, without question. Got to college on a financial aid package, I didn't even need student loans, took out student loans unnecessarily, ran up thousands of dollars of debt. Worked at Vibe Magazine, as the brother said, throughout my 20s, I was making six figures as I'm running around the country, chasing Tupac Shakur, Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, living that life. And then when I got fired from Vibe Magazine at age 30, the only thing I had to show for it was a computer and a stereo system, nothing else. And I ended up, one, one year after getting fired, I was basically homeless after all that success. So I had to start all over again, and that's why now in my 40s I work for myself and I own where I live because I realized, man, you don't want to ever be destitute like that. You grew up poor, now here you are struggling again in your adult life, and yes, we should never let racism off the hook. Mr. Fields is absolutely right. There's something called institutionalized or systemic or structural racism that works every single day in the school system, in the mass media culture, in terms of who can get a job or who can't get a job. If you have a criminal record, if you're one race, you know what happens to you. If you're another race, you know what happened to you, happens to you. But even uh, that is going on and we should always have a critique of it. One of the things that I say, because I want to move this towards solutions, is that we also have to have an honest self-examination of ourselves. In other words, my hero has always been Malcolm X. There's no one in my, my life who's had a bigger impact on my life. No one, dead or alive. And the reason why I love Malcolm so much is when I read his autobiography, the movie's cool, the, the book. Remember when Malcolm got to prison, he realized I only have an eighth grade education. He realized he could barely read his own signature. But if we're serious about catching the entrepreneurial spirit, the first thing you got to do is ask yourself, what education 
or skill sets do I have right now? And then take it a step further and ask yourself, do I have the courage? Am I willing to go back and get a GED or a high school diploma? Am I willing to go to trade or vocational school? Am I willing to come to your college? Am I willing to do that? No one's going to do it for you but you. If Malcolm X could sit in that prison cell and realize I got to start reading the dictionary, starting with the letter A, the word aardvark, and read the entire dictionary and transform his life because he read and he read and he read. And when he came out as a member of the Nation of Islam, because there's also leadership there, Brother Muhammad knows what I'm talking about. There was an organization, there was a program in place led by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that grabbed him and said, okay, this is what we can do. And if you look at the history of the nation, all those businesses that they had. Malcolm fell right in line. Are y'all with me out there? So as you're doing that for yourself, we also need people who have the willingness to say, as Brother Phil said, I'm going to be an advocate for all these black men who are unemployed out here. I'm going to do what Reverend Dr. William Howard has done in Newark, New Jersey, one of my mentors, who said, my church, my church is going to work with brothers coming out of jail, I'm going to form a covenant, an agreement with local businesses, and I'm going to say to those businesses, if we get these young men prepared for work, are you going to hire them, particularly because our church members in this community frequent your businesses on a regular basis? Y'all need to, if you go to church or a masjid or any religious institution, and you give your tithes every single week, and your church does not have a program that is about employing people in our communities or setting up opportunities for them, you need to challenge the pastor or the imam, or you need to go find another church or another mosque because they're not doing the work of God. It's that serious out here. You know, it is that serious out here. It is a tragedy to me that we live in a city where that report that he put out a few years ago, Mr. Fields, 50% of black men between 16 and 64, we're talking about sons, fathers, and grandfathers unemployed. So the question becomes, what are we gonna do? I submit the answers again are all in our history. If our sisters and brothers during an era of American history called Jim Crowism or segregation, when they knew they could be hung from a tree simply for wanting to start a business, could have the courage to start a business, what's keeping us back in 2010? If they could have the courage to say on a plantation where I know the penalty for even knowing how to read a Bible could mean my death, but I'm gonna teach myself how to read anyway. There is nothing stopping you in 2010 from saying, you know what, I'm gonna get my reading skills up, I'm gonna get my math skills up, I'm gonna get my speaking skills up, and I'm gonna make sure in spite of everything people are saying about me, I'm gonna become that spirit of an entrepreneur. What does it mean? That means that you're gonna go out today or tonight and look up who Reginald Lewis was, the first black billionaire in this country, you're going to go find a book called Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? Why Should White Guys All Have All the Fun? You're going to read that book from cover to cover. You're not going to complain about how big that book is, how many pages is in it. You're going to read it because you're going to see that this man who came from a humble background just like you, if he could do what he did, you can do it too. What are you going to do? Bring it back to Dr. King, who Mr. Gregory knew very well. You're going to read one of the best pieces that he wrote at the end of his life. It was called Black Power Redefined. Black power redefined. There's a reason why Dr. King talks so much at the end of his life about economic development. That's what you're going to do. What are you going to do? If you're like me, you're a hip-hop head for life. Where are my hip-hop heads out, out there? If you're a hip-hop head for life like I am, you know what I mean, son? If you're a hip-hop head like me, you're going to understand there's a difference between hip-hop culture and the hip-hop industry. We're not going to embrace the destructive stuff that we hear on the radio all the time, we see on TV all the time. What we're going to embrace is the culture, which is a spirit of entrepreneurialism. When you see someone starting from scratch and creating a record label or a t-shirt company or a video company, when you see brothers selling CDs in the barbershop, when you see brothers on the streets, that's hip-hop. That's hip-hop. That's what you're going to emulate, the entrepreneurial side of it. And what you're going to do, you're also going to understand, and I agree that there's opportunities in exports overseas, but 
Everyone in this room at this point has what we call a handheld device. I got a Blackberry. And I refuse to believe that only our white brothers and sisters can create something like Facebook, which we use, and Twitter, which we use. Every one of y'all, if you're born in the 70s, 80s, 90s, you are technology savvy. There's nothing stopping you from inventing something, particularly when you come from a tradition of inventors. The folding chair, black person. Traffic light, black person. We can go on and on and on. So what is stopping you from t in 2010 for saying, I love this technology, I'm going to create something? Nothing. And lastly, I'm just going to say this. I think that we got to challenge and move aside the people who call themselves leaders in our communities. Enough of all the conferences, reports, and studies. This one's important because the people here are making sense, Mr. Quash. You know, but enough of all the conferences, reports, and studies. I am now in my 40s, and I've been hearing the same stuff since I was 18 years old. We need people, exactly, we need people who are doers. The next time someone says something to you about what black folks need to be doing, you need to ask them, do they own a business? If they say no, you, don't, you need to ask them, well, what are you doing? Do you own a piece of property? No. I'm like, you're not even an example of what you are talking about. So I say this to all of us. I own where I live, and I own a business. And so if we're going to talk about entrepreneurialism. Are you even practicing what you preach? God bless you all. Uh, we, we really want to have him have uh, the honor of being called Congressman Kevin Powell, and I think that's something that will come to fruition for him. Uh, let's give him another hand. And it's, 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 it's so important, the words that he said, uh, uh, the Reverend Al Sharpton and the National Action Network just had their uh, uh, conference, and one of the things that they were talking about was you know, enough of the talk. What are we going to do? What are, what are we going to do? Implementing plans that we're, that we're going to actually follow up with, setting a timeline for ourselves, a 30-day timeline, a 45-day timeline, a 90-day timeline, stuff that we are actually going to implement. En enough of the talk, but we've got to actually start to do. We've been talking a long time, having a lot of conferences, have a lot of reports, and a lot of different uh, articles and different things written, but it, now it is time for action because there are many things in this society that are changing, and we need to stop becoming observers and be participators in these type of things. We are ex extremely delighted here at York College. Not only delighted, but honored to have uh, as our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Ron Daniels. He is, um, since he's come to York College, he sits on the advisory board of the York College Mail Initiative Program. He um, actually does a, a tremendous amount of work uh, uh, with respect to so many projects. His bio is in the program. I'm not going to read his bio for you because it's several pages and, uh, and you can read that on your own. I will just tell you though, from my own personal experience, here's a person I've grown up listening to, a person whom I've had the pleasure of meeting, and a person whom I actually admire, and I call him my hero, uh, because he indeed is a person who is, uh, you know, and I say this uh, anywhere I go, because anyone will tell you he's a walking encyclopedia, point blank and simple. He really is. He, he's, he's, uh, he's, a, he's a man of, uh, of, uh, uh, of character uh, uh, and integrity, and, uh, and a person who actually uh, I believe that we should all aspire, those of us who in education, higher education, we aspire to be like. Um, on a personal level, I really find myself um, uh, very, very, uh, 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 I guess, attracted to his, his way he relaxes. This is also a person that I respect. I, I'm, a, I'm a minister, and so therefore what, what, what Jesus tells us is that we should be fishers of men. Well, he is a real fisherman, and uh, he's one of New York, New York's best bass fishermen, in case you did not know that. But let us receive at this time the distinguished lecturer of York College, Dr. Ron Daniels. Uh, I need a press agent, that's for sure. So maybe I can, I can hire Brother Jonathan Quash to uh, assist in that regard. Y'all all right out there? Y'all enjoying what you're hearing so far? That's good, that's good. Let's give Jonathan Quash a big round of applause for being the director of the Mail Center here at York College. 
I am delighted to be here at York College as its first distinguished lecturer, and that sounds kind of good. You know, yep. Brother Kevin, when you've been out here and all these years you've been battered and all these wars, you know, and somebody pulls you in and say, well, we'll make you a distinguished lecturer. That, right. that, that does make you feel like kind of good. So I don't usually say these things, but I just kind of like that distinguished lecturer thing. You know what I mean? So uh, very often I, I, I don't like to do that, but that one does ring nicely. Uh, I am really honored to also to be a part of this distinguished panel. It's been rich so far. Uh, certainly, um, Brother Harry Wells is right here. One of the things is, is I'm in and out so much. I mean, I teach, and but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm doing so many things until I have yet to really connect with a lot of my colleagues here. So, we, I'm, I'm, have been to Haiti uh, 50 or 60 times. Um, economic development is going to be a big thing in Haiti, also. And we have a large Haitian population in this district and at this school. And so when he was saying go to Africa, I said, well, yeah, Brother Harry, we also want to connect with Haiti because there's going to be huge business opportunities there. But just the idea that we have someone with, with this rich legacy and history and experiences here to share is one of the reasons that makes York College you know, very, very special. And of course, uh, looking forward to hearing uh, from uh, what well, we've heard from Kevin Powell. And uh, um, Kevin Powell is, uh, is no question one of the leading voices of our time. And he, uh, in, many, in many, many fields, and I've watched him work in his handbook, which I recommended to the Men's Center, and one of the people I said to, to Jonathan, I said, we've got to have, get Kevin here at your college. We need to bring him back, actually, uh, again, because uh, I, I'm not aware of anybody who has done more superb work on the issue of black male development and the issue of, uh, of black men than Kevin Powell. I mean, that's just one of his areas, but that's an area, it seems to me, that he stands out. Uh, almost singularly. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, my longtime friend, uh, Dick Gregory, who is uh, one of our gurus, I was just, we were just reminiscing, it was 20 years ago, Dick, when we went out to Omaha, Nebraska, and declared May 19th in the National African American Day of Commemoration in, in reflection on El Haj Malik El Shabazz and um, Sonia Sanchez, Dr. Maulana Karinga, Dr. Betty Shabazz was there on that day, and so forth. And of course, uh, we are looking. Uh, to hear from Minister Abdul Hafiz Muhammad. Uh, only time I get a chance to see him is when I'm in Chicago or when he comes to your college <laughs> uh, and so forth. So anyway, having said all those things, I'm not going to try to be too long, I don't hope. But I've heard a number of things that are, I think are very important. Uh, I've dabbled around in the business thing too, but I'm largely a social political activist. I'm largely a scholar activist, and this is say an intellectual. An intellectual is an action-oriented theorist. Uh, so therefore, I'm in the academy, but I'm not sort of just enthralled with the academy. I'm interested in translating theory into practice. And so that's how I spent most of my life. Uh, and so I'm more, more social critic, more social philosopher than business person, even though I have organized some businesses, because I think this is an incredibly important part uh, of our work. And I do that in part because, you know, I'm, I come out of the nationalist Pan-Africanist tradition. And Malcolm X said that black nationalism only means that we should control the politics and economics and social life of our communities. And so it's in that spirit that I also, in Youngstown, Ohio, we created some cooperatives, you know, we created institutions. And so that's a part of what I'm about. And so we want to have the entrepreneurial spirit, no question about that. We want to build businesses, there's no question about that. But to me, the question is several points. It's to be of the race and for the race. It's about vision and values also. I'm not interested really in creating more people who might turn out to be like Bernie Madoff. I'm not really interested in people who will turn out to be entrepreneurs who will, we will feed them, help build them, they become billionaires, and then they say we have no responsibility and accountability to the very community that helped to produce you if indeed we are to be liberated as a people, and we will, is because we produce people in an era where people are talking about being in post-racial America who are actually of the race and for the race. And when I say that, I say that with no animosity and hostility to anyone. Right. Among the things I've done, I've been executive director of the National Rainbow Coalition. That means Rainbow Coalition, dealing with all kinds of people. My previous experience was at the Center for Constitutional Rights for 12 years, which is a predominantly white organization. So it's not about being antagonistic to anyone. But I do believe that charity begins at home and spreads abroad. That love thy neighbor as thyself. And you do that not in some narrow, egotistical way, but within a sense of spiritual values that are 
fundamentally a part of who we are as African people. And so when Brother Kevin Powell talks about that and when uh, uh, our, our brother Harry Wells sort of reflects on that history, to me that is fundamentally important, that we be grounded in who we are as a people that we not lose our birthright, that we not lose that which is essentially makes us uh, a leading people in the world. And so we've always been about economic development. And I want to talk about that a little bit and sort of go over some of the same points that um, Harry Wells went over in just a little bit. Because if you go back to Paul Cuffey, it was one of the earliest reflections, of you know, black businessman, colonial period. He was interested in, in beginning to talk about how he could commercially hook up and link up with the Caribbean and Africa and various other places. A businessman. And when you really go back to the, this era of the exclusion of black people within in these hostile American shores, we must always go back to one of the most fundamentally important institutions, that is the black church. The black church created, at least in its institutionalized form and as a denomination, 1787, uh, Richard Allen, and Absalom Jones, who create the African Methodist Episcopal Church, if you will. But it's not just, they don't create it just as an insular religious institution. They create the, the African free societies. They create African free schools. And equally important, they create something called mutual aid societies. There's a direct line between those mutual aid societies and A.G. Gadsden. These mutual aid societies became the progenitors. They became the basis and the seeds for black banks and black insurance companies in black America. I remember my father talking about uh, uh, being in, in Georgia and he talked about uh, you know, uh, people working. And this is the other thing we should understand. When we start talking about rekindling the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit, we must understand that we have always had that spirit, the inventive spirit, the entrepreneurial spirit. And so, and, but there's been something that, that also has been there fighting to keep us down. To, and that's not an excuse for us not doing it. I don't want to say that. But there's a reason why we are the way we are. And so we ought to understand. My father talked about the fact of people going around, you know, creating these mutual aid societies. In fact, my grandfather is buried in Georgia and it's called a mutual aid cemetery. People put their money together and, and, they, and they created these insurance companies in the middle of hostile apartheid. Black people coming together, putting their resources, pooling their resources to get things done. And so out of that, that whole notion, you had, and, and as, as was alluded earlier, there used to be in the midst of segregation, there were commercial districts everywhere. When we, my father used to drive us from, from Youngstown, Ohio, two routes, either we went by Bay of Beckley, West Virginia, or, and crossed the border that way and came into Georgia, or we went by way of Cincinnati. And when you crossed the so-called Mason-Dixon line, you know, in those days, you know, you had, the, you had your little tea cakes and your, your chicken sandwiches and so forth waiting to get to the next town. But if you got to Nashville, you could go to the black section. If you got to Memphis, you could go to Beale Street. Almost everywhere you went, black people had put their resources together to create a black business district. Almost everywhere. That's a part of the entrepreneurial spirit we had. And some of them were especially thriving, Black Wall Street and Tulsa, especially thriving. Destroyed by, as Kevin Powell correctly put out, by white terrorism. After black people had fought in the First World War, came home, black men shot down and gunned down in their uniforms in 19 in the bloody red summer. And then Tulsa, part of that history that we also have to remember as we move forward. And so these, these business districts and, and, and some of that came out of the spirit of, of a lot of people, not just Booker T. Washington. He was one of those spirits. But I have to remind you, and, and Booker T. did a great thing, but there was a debate, as someone mentioned earlier, between he and W.E.B. Du Bois. W.B. Du Bois attacked him on the grounds that, look, we, can, we don't really just need to be accommodating to vocationalism and sort of situating ourselves to be a part of capitalism. We can also advance socially and politically in the society. But what people don't also understand is that Booker T., that W.E. Du Bois had himself a program of economic development. Go back and read the Crisis Magazine in the 1930s. He was, he was in fact criticized by the NAC because he asked for the whole question of creating an internal common market. That's, that's W.E.B. Du Bois. A lot of people don't know that about him. And people were saying that he was doing self-segregation. And they, they, they jumped on him for that. A. Philip Randolph 
one of the most remarkable people really in the history of black, that black people ought to be looking at, A. Philip Randolph, sleeping car porters, I mean, and brilliant organizer, socialist, if you will. But one of the other things, when you go back, and, and he also talks about economic development. That's A. Philip Randolph. But the thing he talked about in terms of economic development, he says, as we develop business as black people, what will be our attitude in our businesses towards labor? Will we have businesses that are as exploitative of labor as we see in terms of the captains of industry? He raised that question. He was raising the question of moral and of values. What is that we will do? Will we be just like white people? Or will we create a new paradigm in terms of what we do with business? We already talked about Marcus Garvey. We know his scheme. Marcus Garvey, if we today, I mean, all Marcus Garvey lacked was the pool of talent that we have now. All of the, all of the engineers and technicians and accountants that we have now, there is really in some ways no excuse for us to still be even talking about the issue of how do we do black economic development because we have so many talented people with us today. Du Bois, obviously Garvey, the, the, the line between Garvey, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X, I mean, all talking about the critical question of economic development. I also alluded to the fact that Malcolm X, you know, talked about in black nationalism only means he was talking about controlling the politics and economics of our community. And we still face that challenge. We're still in a situation where we still believe the white man's ice is always colder. That's why when Dr. Karinga says that the key crisis in black life is the cultural crisis, even as far as we have come now, it is still a crisis. There are still some of us who would prefer to go to the white dentist, the white everything, because we believe the white man's ice is, is colder. Even though, you know, we ought to know better. The inability, how do, you, how do you account for the fact that you can go to Harlem? You know, I, mean, I, went, I rolled up in Baltimore in the inner city, and they had a whole sign out here about all this soul food, so forth and so on. And I was, you know, I was going to get me a little something. And I rolled up in there, and there was somebody in there who did not look like me at all in the middle of Baltimore. I mean, and, 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 and you know, Bob Law has talked a great deal about this, about all of the different ways in which we spend our money with people who do not look like us. And I'm not saying that in a hostile way, but there is something to the notion of controlling the politics and economics of your community, which means that you must love yourself first. And if somebody is gonna do business in your community, there ought to be a covenant. I don't care what color you are. There ought to be certain things that you are not allowed to do, black, white, and indifferent. You don't sell drugs. You don't, you don't sell liquor to minors. You don't sell, and you, in fact, contribute back to the community, irrespective of what color you are. So therefore, you can't call it racist because you're saying even everybody should do that. But we let people just come into our community, rip us off, take us off, you know, and we'd be glad to do that. We get, it's habitual. It's like, oh, tell me why the cage bird sings. We're in the cage, and we just keep going back to the same old things over and over again. We've raised that struggle too. Adam Clayton Powell, you know, uh, 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 um, others, um, the, the sister who led the anti lynching campaign, she was also, uh, Ida B. Wells, others, fighting these campaigns to also so we say we ought to control the businesses in our community. Coming to a close. So Malcolm, but also Martin Luther King. And Kevin cited a piece uh, that, that, that's incredibly important, but a lot of people also don't know that Martin Luther King in the speech the night before he got, the night before he was assassinated, there's a whole section in that speech. And when she talks, he challenges black people to harness our resources, to use it for our own development. And in that he says, support our businesses, but he also says that if there are businesses that are exploiting us, that are taking advantage of us, we ought to withdraw our support from them using economic sanctions as a tool for our liberation. That's Martin Luther King talking, all right? But there's also something else that King talked about, and this is, this is the, the thread I close on. And that is King said that true compassion is more than flinging a coin at a beggar it comes to understand that the edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. That's right. Now what King was saying is that it's okay. And by the way, Harry Belafonte talks about this too. He says, look, and, and, and Dick, I'm sure you are familiar with this. At the end of his life, King became very concerned. And Harry Belafonte tells the story of, of uh, and, and I guess he was with Donald Payne over in uh, New Jersey. They were at this, his house and he said, he said, I, I now fear that maybe I am leading my people into a burning house. And what he meant by that was he did not want us to sacrifice 
who we are as a people. That is to say, if we are in a capitalist society, there is no reason why we cannot find, find ways, in fact, to transform capitalism. And by that, I don't mean anything necessarily. I don't want you to go out and storm the Bastille. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that they are looking at ways and means by which, in fact, we, are, we become socially responsible. We, we lift up A.G. Gaston. We were talking to Walter and I before. I mentioned A.G. Gaston, uh, Brother Fields. I mean, uh, Brother Harry. Because A.G. Gaston was the kind of businessman we need. He was socially responsible. He helped finance the civil rights movement. Herman Russell, uh, uh, there's another brother, the other insurance brother from down in, um, in, in Atlanta also. These were people who were, who were business people, but they had a sense of responsibility and accountability to their community. Today what we have is people who just want to get paid, who just want to get money. Walter and I was talking about all the people who are on Wall Street today who are making fabulous fortunes. They, do, they live in large. But what does that mean in relationship to the rest of us? And at some point, they may not be living large anymore. Then they come to the community, then we have to rescue them because somehow they forgot from whence they come. We, Fannie Lou Hamer said, always remember who we are. Always remember where we came from and honor the bridges that brought us over. And so King, finally, he said also something to this effect. He said, what we really need in America is a revolution of values. We must rapidly make the shift, he said, from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. He said, whenever machines and property rights and computers are seen as being more important than people, he said, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and so forth are, are incapable of being conquered. So the challenge for us is to revive the entrepreneurial spirit, but to do it in a way which is, in fact, consistent with the ancient principles of my art, of righteousness and justice. We can create a world and we can create business people who can treat each other in a humanistic way. We do not want to replicate the madness we see on Raw Street today. The Bible says it is not money, but the love of money which is the root of all evil. We saw that on what? The love of money, where people are shuffling paper and making billions of dollars, creating no jobs, creating nothing which is productive. We do not want to have that kind of entrepreneurial spirit. George Frazier is somebody I recommend to you because George Frazier, uh, George Frazier has something called Power Networking. Look it up on the internet. He has two, three major books. One, the first book he, that sort of lit people on fire was Success Runs in Our Race. Get that book, Success Runs in Our Race. And then the next one was Race for Success. The next one is Click. He has the largest network of black professionals in, the, in, in America today, over 60,000. And when you go to his conferences, you find people who are socially responsible, who are accountable, who really want to do two things, he says, to produce wealth, that can be passed on intergenerationally, which is another thing Brother Kevin Powell was talking about. We have to create wealth, not just jobs, wealth that can be passed on intergenerationally. And his last point is he wants to make black people the number one employees of black people in the 21st century. Those are two laudable goals that we can achieve if we are first and foremost committed to being of the race and for the race, of the race and for the race in a very respectful, and principle matter. That's who we are. That's who we are as a people. Those, that's the values we bring to the proposition. Let's not lose our birthright. Let's keep the entrepreneurial spirit, but let's do it in a way that God would find to be pleasing in his eyes. Thank you very kindly. Thank you so much, Dr. Daniels. Um, those, I think we're just, you know, it's just more and more. It just continues to go. Everyone who gets up here just continues to enlighten. We are um, sort of saddened today. The, the, uh, we had a presentation by Professor Michelle Gregory, uh, who uh, unfortunately is not feeling well and was, was in the hospital last week. And she's out now, but uh, was trying to take it easy. So she uh, asked to be excused today. So in her stead, actually, we're going to have her colleague, Professor Francis Peterson, to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Gregory. But I want to say about Professor Peterson, this conference was her idea. This was her, uh, her brainchild. So I want to, let's give her that credit. 
And without her today and without her support to this conference, we would not be here today. And, uh, and, and, and you know, she came to me and had all of these, you know, things in her head and all these visions and all this stuff. And, and she saw the intergenerational connections and all this. And she, you know, she put it together. You know, she did a great job. And so we're going to ask her to come at this time to introduce Mr. Dick Gregory. everyone. Good evening. Okay. For those of you who are too young to know about the extraordinary life of Mr. Gregory, I strongly suggest that you read the bio in your program. Okay. It would take a week for me to present to you all of his accomplishments. Please read them. All right. I first heard Mr. Gregory talk when I was 21 years old, I was a graduate student working on my master's degree at the University of Pennsylvania. When I first heard him, oh my goodness, he was absolutely, in addition to being the funniest man I had ever heard, <laughs> he was also one of the most courageous individuals that I had ever heard. We would get together, a few of us students, and we would pool our money and buy his recordings. And we would pass the album from one to another to another until we wore it out. A long desire of my heart was to have the opportunity to meet Mr. Gregory, shake his hand, and give him one of the biggest hugs that he has ever had. <laughs> now, this evening, I had the opportunity to meet Mr. Gregory, to shake his hands, but I still have not accomplished the hug. <laughs> but I'm keeping hope alive. <laughs> And now, I am an old woman, and my dream has come true. So it's a very special day, and for me to have the privilege to introduce to you Mr. Dick Gregory. <laughs> Let me first say we thank and praise God. Amen. We've all made it here safely today. I pray to God that you'll return and my return will be equally as safe. Um, I uh, was feeling a little strange a few minutes ago, so I left and called my wife again. I've just come off of a fast for Haiti and got in from California last night and got to ripping and running and didn't have time to break my fast. So I called my wife early and said, I'm here and I haven't had time to break my fast. And so I guess I'll do it tonight when I finish. And she said, well, you have a little ginseng, you know, that liquid ginseng. She said, just, you know, take one of those, and then after you finish, uh, then you can do it. And um, so I was reaching in my pocket when I was feeling strange and realized I took my Viagra by mistake. <laughs> so you better try to get out of here as fast as you can. I talked to my daughter earlier today, Michelle, and she was kind of, oh my God. she don't get to see me much and I don't get to see her much. And, 
but I have 10 bright children in Michelle. I didn't realize how bright Michelle was until, see, we lived around rich white folks. My neighbor across the pond was Ocean Spray Cranberry up the hill was Steinway Piano. Now, I'm not like these brothers here. I will come back to the ghetto. I'll die for you, but I'm not living there. <laughs> See, my brother think he know what being poor was like. Talking about the rats and roaches in the house. We were so poor, the only thing a rat would do now would take a shortcut to get, you know. <laughs> I never cared that much about school and education when I'm getting it from a white, racist, sexist, insane system. But I had enough sense to know I had to fake it through because I've always asked a simple question. How is you as a mother have four children and don't put them in school by five or six and you break a truancy law and you go to jail? But if two of them starved to death, they would just give your other two to a foster home, but you'd never go to jail. Something wrong with that. Yes. Hmm. So Michelle came up to me one day. I came home. She said, Dad, I, I got to do this uh, uh, paper, uh, and I had a choice of doing it on the astronauts or the family. And... And so I chose to do it on the family. I just want to ask you some simple questions like, how did you and Ma, uh, how did you propose to her? And I said, well, Michelle, we got married on February the 2nd, and you was born on May the 28th. <laughs> and she calculated and said, oh, I think I'll do it on the astronauts, you know. <laughs> So let me say it's a pleasure to, to be here to listen. And you know, you could take what is here and run the whole world. The whole world. This brother here qualifies to run General Motors. but not in a white racist society. Huh? I'm one of the brilliant comics that ever lived in America. The first one to work white nightclub because the ones came through before me, they wouldn't let them in. And am I stupid enough to believe that I was the first? When I look at Brother Gaston, I knew him well. When the riot hit, man, I was, I was, I was coming back from the liquor store with a fifth of whiskey. But how many Gastons died? Huh? Obama, the first president, we had aunts and nieces and nephews and brothers and fathers that qualified to be president. But yet in a white racist system, they reduce us down to believe that this is the first one ever that even qualifies. Huh? I didn't realize how hip this college was, man, till y'all invited the brother there. I don't know if y'all bring him here. So when I see that move, I could trust all my grandchildren with y'all for a minute. And so I'm just glad to be here to hear, to see what young folks. Yeah, go to Africa. But when you go to Africa, you better damn sure believe you're going to bump into the CIA, British intelligence, French intelligence, China intelligence, and the KGB. I don't think you're going over there with some normal stuff. There's nothing wrong with it if you know it. I looked at the way y'all fell out over the Willie Lynch letter. How many of y'all read that? Read it again. That language is 1960 language. White folks didn't talk like that 300 years ago. Are you crazy?
that came out the CIA headquarters. They stay a jump ahead of you just when you get ready to break out. They give you this and you walk, walk. Yeah, man, that's right. I'm so glad two years now, I'll be 80 years old. I always wanted to be old. Huh? I thought old black men were so cool. And now for the first time, I wish I was back in high school. Every time I pick up the paper, I'm reading where teacher get arrested for having sex with the students. Well, if I'd have had teachers like that when I was in school, I'd have had a perfect attendance record. <laughs> I can just see my mama now. Boy, where are you going out here on Christmas morning with them books? I'm going to school, mama. Why are you going to school on Christmas Day? Oh, I'm getting a little behind in my class. And boy, this thing is moving so fast. And don't let nobody tell you, there ain't a difference between black folks and white folks. That's the biggest game on the planet. You know damn good and well it's a difference. Let's listen to that Cialis commercial. And it comes in your living room. And if you have a four-hour erection, go to the emergency room. Now, you know that's for white folks. In my neighborhood, a four-hour erection is called a treat. Call three more women and go down and tip the pharmacist. Oh my God. And one thing you young dudes get out of the mentoring, understand one thing that we don't like to talk about. Most of us don't even know it. He touched on a piece of the strongest two forces in the history of America has always been the black woman in the black church. No, you could clap just because it sounds good. Let's prove it. We the only group of people in the history of planet Earth that could start at the bottom and make it all the way to the top in one generation. Kennedy family took them 12, stealing, bootlegging, ripping off banks, murdering. Jesse Jackson, it's hard for you to believe it, but this white racist system had one of the fine minds on this planet. But you have to leave here to know how he's respected. Didn't know nothing about his daddy. Hmm? Mama wasn't educated. From the bottom to the top. Huh? In one generation. Huh? The only Negro on the Supreme Court right now is Clarence Thomas. Didn't know his daddy. Mama couldn't read or write. Washed toilets in hotels. Scrubbed floors. One generation from all the way to the top. Now, I know a lot of y'all don't like him. I don't care that much about him. But I blame Clarence Thomas on you black women. You take a brother with nappy hair big lips, wide nose, thick jaw, look very Negroic. And y'all wouldn't go to the prom with him. Hmm? So he grew up getting a white woman and hate us all. So I'm teaching my granddaughters, when you see them kind of brothers, just go to the prom with them. Hmm? Understand this vicious system. We qualified to run General Motors. We qualified to run every major corporation. The first eight presidents of the United States were black men. Washington was the ninth president. America's birthday is July the 4th, 1776, and that thug didn't become president until 89, and nobody said, who ran the country? Eight black men, Moors, the Moors flag is a cherry tree. That's what they mean when they say George Washington chopped down the cherry tree. It's a game. I didn't just get to the point that I got brilliant. I came over here brilliant. 
You know, I want to run back to Egypt. They give me Egypt because the Egyptians is the lightest African on the continent of African. But you got to go 6,000 years before them chumps and get to the Nubians. All that stuff they got in Egypt came from there. When I look at this here, it's beautiful. Re-energizing our entrepreneurial spirit, I just would have said, in a white racist sexist system. Then you wouldn't get caught off guard. And I'm glad my man told y'all about debt and credit because it's mean. The biggest problem I had when I got married, my wife couldn't handle debt. When are we gonna pay Sears and Roebuck? Baby, we ain't got no money. And when I get to me some money, Sears and Roebuck ain't my first priority. <laughs> Them white folks ain't that dumb. They knew I wasn't going to pay for this stuff when I got it. I walk in the house two weeks later. My wife says, that they did it, they did it. What? It's Sears and Roebuck, final notice. I read it, final notice. Huh. Thank God we won't be hearing from them no more. First, y'all too damn emotional. <laughs> Neiman Marcus called me the other day. They got to talk nice to you now because so many people ain't paying their debt. So they got to be nice. They can't call no attitude now. <laughs> Neiman Marcus called me. Uh, I was sorry to bother you, Mr. Gray. When can we expect a payment? I said, I'm not in charge of your expectations. You can expect a payment anytime. <laughs> yeah, be like Motel 6. Leave the light on. <laughs> so you got to stop being emotional and, and just use your wisdom that you was born with. My damn brother called me up today, nervous, scared. They about, they about to repossess my car. What must I do? Don't park in front of the house. <laughs> so you youngsters, you born a hell of a time. When we sit and we talk about Marcus Garvey, don't never leave out the point that the FBI busted him. He raised more money off Madison Avenue than's ever been raised in the history of the planet. Then they took him down. Huh? One of the brilliant minds on this planet is George Washington Carter. The government came to him and said, World War II, we'd like for you to create us something can come out of that ground and we can make ink and glue and paint and plastic and dye. And he came up with the soybean. And the fastest cancer group in America today is vegetarians because they don't know soybean was never meant to eat. That was his brilliance. They told him what they wanted. Hmm? And then he took care of it. Huh? Henry Ford did not invent a damn car. The Duray brothers in Massachusetts invented a car. The Ford thug stole it. And all over the world, they never get credit for inventing a the car. They get credit for mass production. Hmm? And anywhere you go in the world where they're talking about mass production, they talking about the plant. Why? Because George Washington Carver brought Henry Ford down to Tuskegee and said, Mr. Ford, if you look at this research I got here with this plant here, if you take it back and let your engineers build you a system just like this, you can produce more than one car at a time. That's why mass production has been called the plant. He invented that. Huh? Eli Whitney ain't invented no damn cotton gin. How you going to invent a cotton gin, rich white boy, and you ain't never picked cotton? 
a rich white boy came down from Yale to visit his rich white mother's friend in Virginia, and they saw this nigga out there with this little box, and he went back and put a patent on it. And the reason they can't deny it, because the woman sued him, and the records is in federal court. Huh? That's what this is about. When I look at the, the, the brilliance of Elijah Muhammad, I lived around the corner from him. Oh, we talk about the Million Man March, but what we don't talk about, the white press didn't touch it until three days before when they noticed something strange. All the hotels was full, a hundred mile radius, and they kept saying to the white people, what y'all got? Nothing, huh? Buses was putting in for insurance. And they said, well, what's going on? And the unions who know how to organize with a billion dollar kitty, they would never organize a large march that wasn't in the summertime when the children was out of school and on the weekends. He picked October. Hmm. And over a million point nine people showed up. They still arguing over how many came. I told the honorable minister, Farrakhan, he didn't listen to me. I said, man, if you want to get the right count, we got to go there and have a rumble. He said, you mean fight? I said, yeah, that's what rumble meant when you was a Christian. But he didn't listen to me. I can just see it now. If the brothers would have jumped on one of them white ladies, I can just see the headline now. Two million of them showed up. Somewhere. So I say, take what you heard here and listen to your emotions and get rid of it. I had 10 brilliant children. That was my daughter the first time two weeks ago that prosecuted a Jewish rabbi for pedophilia. First time it ever happened. That was my daughter. That didn't surprise me. I knew who they were. Don't you proud? Got ten children through college. The money I was making, I could have got dumb ones through. You know, college in America, you can't pay enough money to get some dumb person through college. And so when you stop and think about how fast this thing is moving, and what we've left to you youngsters, there's some pieces that's missing. Hmm? Damn right. If I ain't got no money, I'm going to take one of them subprime houses. You crazy? Men date glamorous women and ain't even got the money. Lose all their, all their, gamble all their money away. Drink all their money away. But remember one thing. When you're poor and oppressed plus racist system wiping you out, you look for instant gratification. You ain't got a damn thing to do with that. That's universal. If you took crack and couldn't feel it for six days, you wouldn't take it. I'm looking for instant gratification. That's why you go out and get a bottle of wine. I bought a bottle of wine, Rockchild, 1904. I didn't know nothing about it. I just saw it on the menu. It said $6,800. Let's get it. Good wine don't even make you high. Hmm? Good wine. Expensive wine. That's why that old 20 cents bottle of pluck, you get drunk before you take the bottle down for your mouth because they know you need instant gratification. <laughs> huh? That's what this is about. And let me tell you something about malt liquor. Malt liquor is not sold in white neighborhoods. And we ain't got enough common sense to say, how come white beer companies is making something for me? Only sold in my neighborhood because they got a thing in it called manganese. And once you get enough manganese, you'll kill your mama. But we stupid enough and ungodly enough to believe that's our behavior. Huh? Mm -hmm. 
The Ku Klux Klan didn't inject 600 black men in Tuskegee with syphilis. That was the United States government, the United States Bureau of Health. It's a game they play. And when I got an invitation, when Clinton finally decided to, to bring the men there and apologize to them in the White House, I get my little funny invitation. I didn't go. I said, what about the women? You can't infect me with syphilis, and I don't pass it on to my woman? And how come it was Tuskegee? Because when you go back that far back, Tuskegee was the citadel of intellectual. Around the world, people sent their children from around the world, and what them thugs did is they put poison in the intellectual water well. That's what that was about. And you boys should know how you like when you get to college to dib and dab with more than one. That's what that was about. But it didn't work. You sit down and do a program and write down 100 world-renowned African Americans. 98 of them is the product of black colleges not Harvard, Yale, or MIT. And if you really do your homework right, you find out all the Ivy League schools, huh? Princeton, Columbia, all of them was founded by slave masters' money so they could have some place to send their little dumb punk sons. I was the first black to give a commencement address at Harvard University, and I wasn't going to do it, but the students came and begged me. They said, it's the first time they let us pick a speaker. And the reason the class of 1925 is 1975 is celebrating their 50th anniversary, and that class produced more billionaires than the other class, and they wanted to impress them. So the first time they let us speak the speaker, so we would stay here. Please speak here. So I went up the next day. I lived 48 miles from that filth house. And I said, I'll do it on one condition. I don't want none of your blood money, and I don't want no honorary doctor's degree. I don't want nothing in my house with your name on it. And then the next day, I told the young folks what they need to do. Harvard and MIT, they're right next to each other, have more suicides in one year than all the Big Ten school have in 20, but they got black folks and white folk believing that's the citadel of intellectuality. Well, my God, that I pray to look down and say it's a cesspool of filth. And when you stop all your emotions huh, and filter through what you've heard here today, then it's different. Then it changes. I'm going back to Mars. We lost two big giants the other day. Hmm? Ben Hooks and Dorothy Hyde. And Dor nobody's ever told a story on Dorothy Hyde. I can never be a racist. It ain't nothing y'all but suckers that believe you can be. Huh? I can dislike you because you Irish Catholic. I can dislike you because you Polish. I can dislike you because you do. That's prejudice. Racism means the ability to control somebody else's faith and destiny. And because I don't like you because you're white, I don't have the power to see two of your children go to a bad school. Hmm? Y'all got to stop all this old crap about coming. You don't live in no community. You live in a neighborhood, a community is where you control your cops, you control your banks, you control your finance, you control your schools. You don't do none of that. So stop lying about the word. You live in the hood. And it's your job, huh? And what they talking about, them old black folks back then, you can't do business like they did. You got to come together with partners. You got to come together and find somebody finished law school, somebody's entrepreneur, somebody's this here, brilliant woman, that, and then come together. But you got to set up a friendship because they're going to come after you. They're going to come. I'm one of the honest cats on the whole world. He never smoked a reefer and he never had sex with a white woman. Okay? I behave myself, right? Hmm? You hear me? I behave myself. If there's anybody that listened to this white boy and did exactly what he say do, right? 
is me. Hmm? This is the front page of a major white paper, the Chicago Tribune. J. Edgar Hoover sent a telex to Chicago office, FBI memo, use mob to kill Dick Gregory. Don't tell me about what this filth is. Huh? I'm one of the cleanest niggas on the planet. Huh? I'm one of the few out here, ain't never been no scandal. Okay? And they come at me like this? Huh? But just do that other thing. Hmm? White boy brought it to me. Hmm? And I took it to the Chicago Tribune. And the agent walked up to me and said, uh, uh, Mr. Gray, why do you think we can't kill you? Because the same thing protects me come out every morning and smack nighttime, clean out the sky. Huh? And they called me and told me, you on the VIP list for the, the, the uh, uh, President Obama's inauguration, and we're going to close the town down there be so many millions of people here, but we're going to pick up the VIPs three hours early. You see, a lot of you black folks, when white folks give you some, some perks, you want to act all intelligent. I, do, I act intelligent around black folks. I get around white folks, I said to the agent, I said, uh, are you bees, y'all bees the same agent uh, uh, that was in Dallas, Texas with Kennedy when he got shot? When you know who you are. You, you heard that here. You don't have to worry about what they think of you. I'm in Budapest at a big conference, and, and they're trying to tap into my head. Uh, Mr. Gregory, what's some of the things you got on your mind? That's not what the conference is about. <laughs> but they know black folk, most of y'all will just tell them, I, me? I, I, I said, well, I, I wake up every morning trying to figure out Oh, what happened to albinos after high school? <laughs> Every high school got albinos and they just disappear. I ain't never seen an albino on an airplane or, you know, been in the army, wasn't no albinos in the army, huh? You ain't never heard no woman say albino rape me, they'd be easy to catch. You know. Somewhere. John Brown, John, Ron Brown, one of the bright minds on the planet. I'm the one that released the picture with the bullet in his head. So y'all go and talk that crap. Behave yourself. Go to get education and we'll be rewarded. And they couldn't deny it because the white folks that did the autopsy brought it to me. It's a game. It's a game. You don't have to get there. We've been there. All you got to do is wipe all that filth off your head that's been planted there. I got mine from my mama. Hmm? Oh, my mother worked hard and, and brought us Christmas, and it was just so nice. The only time I didn't hate them. I didn't like my mama. I didn't like my brother and sister. I didn't like my neighborhood because I believe my inheritance come from God, and if this is the hand God dealt me, I really got me an attitude. But Christmas was really mean. I had a Muslim brother told me, I'm celebrating no whitey Christian holiday. I said, do you Muslim brother? Anytime Christmas come on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and, say, and your bank closed, you celebrating it. And then after my mother do all of that, she told me a white boy brought me that stuff. Huh? And that's still in your head till you wash it off. I go all over the world. I go to China, go to the Christian community. Jesus Christ look Chinese. Go to Japan, Japanese community. Jesus Christ look Japanese. Brazilian look Brazilian. Come back home, go to a black church, hear a white boy. You can laugh at it if you want. That's in there until you deliberately take it out. And you can make a billion dollars, have 29 PhDs. Bill Gates, a good example of that. Got all them PhD, I don't read PhD, and let that dumb white cop trick him out the house and put handcuffs on him. And you know, that got to be some ignorant white folks that call the police. How do you see a black man, he just got back from China, 
They was taking boxes in the house. How do you see a black man taking boxes in the house and think that's a robbery? So I say to you, you don't have to buy it. Just walk by the store. This is a new Esquire magazine. In the damn car, got Jay-Z in the headlines. Meet the real president. They would never say that about Bush with a white entertainer. Meet the real president, huh? huh? Condoleezza Rice had more PhDs than George Bush's whole cabinet. They called her Conley and Condi, and that winch didn't see nothing wrong with it. They never called Madeleine Albright Maddie or Janet Reno Janet. They got a soda pop blacker than her. They called Dr. Pepper. And so this is what you all have to clean up, this mess. George Washington Carver, what a brain, but what a sad man. George Washington Carver never knew black folks. Y'all know the story? He was adopted by a white family. Hmm? Grew up in Iowa. Iowa had integrated schools way back then. The first woman lawyer. I ain't talking about black, the first woman lawyer permitted to go to a law school in this country, University of Iowa. And then people started saying, well, you know, George Washington, you know, he's gay. Y'all ever hear that? Because he had a high-pitched voice. Back then, uh, to be accused of being gay was awful. Hmm? But he'd rather accused to be gay and tell the world what really happened to him. That white family that adopted him, castrated him, so he wouldn't mess with their daughters. Huh? Huh? Oh, have we paid a hell of a price? Huh? Have we paid a hell of a price? Damn fool, last two weeks ago, your state legislator that went on Broadway and put up a billboard with brother walking with his pants hanging below his butt. Hitler never wore his pants below his drawers. You can't find no immaculate dresser than the mafioso. But why don't he put up a billboard showing the last 12 cases of police brutality in New York and how much they had to pay out? Huh? It's easy to pick on the children. Huh? And I hope you young folks don't end up using your children as a cop-out. And clean your mind out quickly. Your head. There's some of y'all sitting in here now. They got some family at home that you know that if you come home with a brother or sister as dark as me, talking about you was in love, they'd have some problems, but they, that ain't for discussion. Y'all don't want to talk about that yellow thing. There ain't no shows about that. There ain't no, and that's real. You can never be a nigga. But everybody discussing that. Why you always grab something you can't be? If I say it here tonight, all you hoes stand up. You get mad, you're a hoe. I didn't call your name. Huh? Somewhere. So we left you a mess to clean up. And so I leave you tonight and I say to you, Here's some research here out of UCLA. You can get off the internet, huh? It did a brain scan. A hundred white folks. They asked them all kinds of questions, then they hooked them up, and then they flashed stuff in front of them. They pictured their children, and you could see the, the brain scan, different uh, happiness, joy. And then they flashed a picture of a black man and. 63% of them fear damn near jumped through their skull and they couldn't lie or deny it because the computer showed it. And most of them didn't know it. Then they did it to 100 black folks, the same thing. And when they showed a black man to them 100, 67% of them reacted with fear. So we always want to reach out and do this without cleaning up this. I'm not saying don't do it. 
But damn it, if it's sharks out there in the ocean, and I got, let me know they there. Don't act like all I got to do is go out, and if I fail, it's my fault. You damn right you're going to fail entrepreneur three times, 3,000 times, maybe. And you got to pick yourself up and keep going. But don't blame it on you. That's been my life. That's why I make it so good. I blame everything on white folks. That's right. I know they're not responsible for it. I don't care. <laughs> but I woke up this morning with a hemorrhoid. I said, white folk did it. Oh, oh. Right down the street in Washington, D.C., police went in the house, went in the wrong house, and, and killed a white man's dog. This is the Washington Post, FBI to review raid that killed the man's dog. And so we left you a mess to clean up. White folk can say this. This is a Philadelphia Inquirer white paper. In daily life, black folks found to be more religious than white folks. They can say it. But if a black press say it, even preachers would be, oh, that's not true. Hmm? So somewhere I say to you youngsters, big job. I'm not saying don't have fun. Everybody ain't supposed to be entrepreneurs. But when you get it in, then you seek out people, seek out what you heard here. Never come to a meeting like this and don't bring a tape recorder. Hmm? So you can take it back and listen to it. Huh? Somewhere. Serious research here. This ran in New York Daily News, way over on the side. Crime linked to pollution. Huh? This white folk talking now. Crime linked to pollution. Polluted water can cause brain damage that turn ordinary people into violent criminals. But they got you believe you doing it and you don't know what they're running through your tap. Huh? Hmm? Huh? Hear this. Listen to this. Roger Masters of Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire, compared crime figures from the FBI with information on industrial discharge. Wait a minute. So I got a friend of mine to get me the stats from the FBI. The relationship between lead exposure and homicide. Huh? FBI keep file. They know exactly when a crime, what the fact lead have. So he goes on to say, the FBI information on industrial discharge of lead and manganese. He found a link between polluted levels and murder, assault, and robbery. Counties with the highest pollution level had a crime rate triple the U.S. average. That's where we are. Y'all got a big job. Don't be scared. Just go on and do it. You understand? And then ask yourself, while you're doing your entrepreneur thing, because you ain't got no money, it ain't going to help you. It's a New York Times article. Workers contain Coke sent to old, sent old soda to poor neighborhood. That's their cold word. You got to read down in this New York Times article to find out that all soda pop has an expiration date on it. And when it reached that, it breaks down to a mild, mild poison. They're in federal court now with Coca-Cola because some white folks and some black folks, after 20 years of doing this, went and told on them that they take the Coca-Colas that's expired out the white stores, redate them, and send them in the black community. Now, are they doing the same thing with pharmaceutical stuff? Huh? So y'all got to stop blaming all kind of crazy stuff on you. Hmm? And somewhere, the internet is so, so out here now, you can get a lot of stuff off of it. And I was listening to you talk about Malcolm. Me and Malcolm was real good, but what Malcolm didn't know, and I didn't know at the time, and as close as I was to Elijah. Huh? 
that those letters Malcolm was getting was coming out the CIA. We went under Freedom of Information Act, and we got all the information. Huh? The letters that Malcolm was sending, and they were sending, all those was coming out the CIA, FBI file. Huh? Somewhere. Then Alex Haley come through, and I tried to pull Malcolm's coat. Alex ain't wrote none of that stuff. Y'all too busy looking for a damn hero. Huh? You the hero. Huh? Alex ain't wrote none of that. Murray Fisher, the senior editor of Playboy magazine, wrote all of that. And look, look, look. I have, I have the best research team in the world. I don't expect y'all, but here's what you do when you go home. If you wrote all them books that Alex wrote in the royalties, in worldwide TV, in the movie, right? In that damn, see, after they kill Mal, here's all y'all need to do. With all that royalty money coming in, all you got to do is Google, why did Alex Haley have to auction off his farm, his folks, after he was dead to pay off his bills? Do that sound like somebody that made millions? This is what the game is about, huh? And so when you sit and listen to our brightest and all of that, I'd have been suckered into it had I not chose to do research. Huh? But all you got to do is just be still and, and listen and humble yourself. Humble yourself. Learn to smile. Y'all walk down with these evil looks on your face like that's going to get you somewhere. Nobody care. Huh? And so black woman, I say to you, you got to help us. Just ask one question. Just ask a question that no black man would lie to you. Ask them with a tape recorder to tell you some of the vicious things a white racist police system have done to them or someone they know. And you'll never hear them say, the cop messed with my car. That ain't me talking. You can do that yourself. They don't give them a school where they teach them don't mess with a brother's car. Huh? They'll kill my mama, my children, shoot my daddy in the head, but they won't mess with my car because when you mess with a little boy's toy, and so somewhere you black women got to understand they reduced us down to boys. Huh? And you got to treat me and nurture me just like these brothers is doing to the brothers here. Not with no mean and evilness. And y'all run around talking about who act white and who think white. Anytime you press your hair, hmm, you trying to look like the slave master's wife. And let me tell you about a racist, insane society. And even white folks don't understand white supremacy. Hmm? The number one kill in Jamaica tonight, as black as y'all are, is bleaching cream. Okay? 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 That's why I don't go there. Go to a country y'all super black. Huh? And don't own a major hotel. Won't even make them go in business with you. They need to send for you. Huh? Bob Marley, me and him had a hell of a falling out. But I refused to work with him at Harvard University when he's the hottest thing on the planet. Why? Because I can't believe you can be that smart and write a song and sing it praising buffalo soldiers, a bunch of pimp black thugs killing buffaloes for the government to starve the Indians to death. Hmm? And we can turn this around. We can turn it around. It don't take long. And brothers, understand who the sister is. Huh? I didn't know how smart my wife was till Kobe Bryant got caught up in that mess. Yeah. Hmm? You remember that? Went home, bought this old lady a $4 million diamond ring. If a white woman tonight accused me of raping her like they accused Kobe, and I give Lillian a $4 million diamond ring, she'll go get two more white women. <laughs> well, she got enough sense to know wherever that ring come from, there's a matching necklace and bracelet. And I don't know why some of you sisters haven't gone to Tiger Woods defense. Huh? That's all he need was a ghetto sister. Dead out the project with about five quack babies. She straightened him out. 
with a big old booty. Big booty Mary. She can't even check out at Kroger's. Can't get through the aisle. So y'all got a big job. Have fun. Enjoy yourself. And you see the whole thing change. I love you. God bless you. Peace be with you. I hope you can stay for just a moment. We have one final speaker, but he's certainly not the least among our speakers today. We are honored, I am honored to call uh, our good friend, Minister Abdul Hafiz Muhammad here today. He is, um, well, his bio is also in the program. He is a person who has been a friend of the York College Mail Initiative program for some time now, and he's gonna come in his own way at this time. Let us give Minister Abdul Hafiz Muhammad a Let me begin all things in the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful. As a Muslim, I use the name Allah, but by whatever name we refer to the creator, by he is the creator and we are the creation. As a student of the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, and as the New York representative of the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan, and the minister of Mosul number seven, it's an honor to be here once again in the university that President Keyes is uh, residing over to her and her staff, to Director Quash of the Men's Center, to Dr. Daniels, to the distinguished dais guests that are here, and to you uh, that are still here. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And after hearing from all of these, my dear brother Kevin Powell and Dr. Daniels and 45 minutes of Dick Gregory, surely I have to get straight to the point. <laughs> Let's give Dick Gregory another well-deserved round of applause because he is one of our great ones that much can be learned from to give us critical thinking. The theme of this program is re-energizing our entrepreneurial spirit. Well, I will say this to all of us, that you cannot have an entrepreneurial spirit in a society that has let you go, but we have not let go of it. We are trying to re-energize business in a capitalist society, which the nature of its society is on the backs of the poor. Woodrow Wilson, who was Ameri one of America's former presidents and the president of Princeton University, believed in classism. The fight between class and classism is that there would be a certain liberal group who would excel to the highest heights of the educational strata, but then there would be a lesser group who would be the burden bearers of education. Today, this is why you have a dysfunctional educational system from the, from the intermediate level to the collegiate level, and in some collegiate levels, yea, most of them, <laughs> we fall short of the goal as well. So I want to begin first, six points. What is the true purpose of education? Because all business starts in education. And whatever our mothers did, they had enough education of self and what they learned from those before them, Brother Powell, by which to direct themselves and build their lives. I remember my mother saying to my father one uh, day, Dr. Daniels, that she was going to leave him if he didn't act right. He worked in a plastics factory, and she worked as a domestic worker washing floors for Jewish families. Some of them treated her very well, and others of them were very ugly to her. But I never grew up, and even being a member of the Nation of Islam, did anything to hate or anything against Jewish members of the families, whom I even knew where they still lived, who mistreated my mother. But she told my father one day that he was going, she was going to leave him. He said, she ain't going nowhere because she ain't got no money. So we lived in Canarsie Houses in Brooklyn. And she took me to the L train so she could ride to Penn Station. And she opened up a bag and it had about $5,000 in it. And said, tell your father I got five more on top of this one. I just brought this one to travel with. I left the other one, but I'm not going to tell you where it is because I don't want you to tell him. 
So I went back and I said, Daddy, Mama got a lot of money. <laughs> Women have a canny or uncanny way of really putting aside a dollar. Yes, yes. We as men, we have a way we got to spend everything we have. There's a thing of having your ASS and there's a thing of having your ASSET. If we put everything on our ASS, then we will have no assets. Mm -hmm. And if you want to have assets, then you need to put less on the jackass and more on the assets. I think you understand the point. True education, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches, is the light of every civilization. True education teaches you to go for yourself. You know that you've received an education when you are able to come forth from your institution and not look for whom you're going to work for. So in the flyer that was put out, it was said that black men need now to adopt the attitude of rather being employed and you should be the employer. We should be the one that go into business. When you talk about being an entrepreneur, you're speaking of ownership, not no, no longer being the burden carriers of this society. We are still carrying this society on our backs. Let's just go to a clear sign of proof. Students in the state of New Jersey today defied the governor and they protested from Newark all the way to Trenton and points all in between and beyond. Because the governor is proposing $870 million in cuts to education, but gave $900 million in breaks to the rich. Now you tell me, how does that compute? And then tell the students that if you get a knowledge of how we got into this situation, then you'll understand what? Why you're giving tax breaks to the rich who are already rich and living off the interests of their richness already? But the poor who have nothing, who have no voice, you break the programs and then you wonder why the students have nothing to do. You destroy the after-school programs that gives them something to do with a creative mind. Rather than being on the streets, it is because, my dear family, we're living in a society that rather see us locked up than to see us grow free. When are we going to wake up and just see it? And I'm not saying Corazon would have been better than Christie, but it's the lesser of two evils but at least you know what you had with Corazon. Now with Christie, you got it straight up like a Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan said, you didn't vote for me, so why should I do anything for you? All of you Negroes in here complaining, he said. He said, you all could just get your money together and build your own facility. And you wouldn't have to worry about me coming and yours saying what I'm saying to you. How much more do we need, brothers and sisters, to know that we have to go for ourselves? Now, do you want an education or do you want a training? A training is like the hunter and the dog that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us about. A hunter would send the dog out every day to retrieve the food. He would bring it back, skin it, and give the dog the bones. The dog went one day and got an education. And when he came back, he brought the hunter the bones, telling him if he could talk, if I'm gonna go hunt, I'm gonna eat what I'm gonna hunt. If you wanna eat, then you go hunt it and you eat for yourself. This is what you and I have to learn. We've been the burden barriers that are carriers too long of this society. When are we now going to break free? The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said, the definition of a slave is when, one, when your master controls the diameter of your thinking, therefore he controls the circumference of your activity. So you look at our activity, it is a product of our thinking. Yes, we've made some progress, but we have not made that total progress of freedom, justice, and equality that we well deserve. There were three sciences that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that were never taught to us. The science of business, the science of warfare, and the science of mating. We don't have time to break that down, but the science of business is what you spoke to earlier, my brother. How can we have four and five bakeries selling the same goods? Why don't we become one conglomerate and serve our community. See, the critical mass, see? Then we, then we can now enlarge ourselves and put more of us to work together. Why do we need to have so many Jamaican restaurants when we can all come together and produce a greater intake for ourselves? When we work for ourselves, then you now have ownership of everything you do. Total 
control. We rather talk health care and jobs to the white elite of this society while they dabble in policy and control. When are we going to talk like that? With all of our intellectual aptitude, we still, well, what are you going to do with that health care for me? You got a job for me? They had brothers sitting on a line. I'm not saying they shouldn't have been there. Everyone has a right to be employed. But the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan says that this human body produces cells that every seven years, billions of them, trillions of them die and new ones come. Every human being can be employed, but we have to break a capitalist society. To any Muslims that are here in the Quran, God says he's going to blot out usury and cause charity to prosper. See, that's business talk. In other words, it's all right to go into business, make a profit, turn it back over to keep the business going, to take care of the workers of the business, to take care of the livelihood, take care of needs in the community to run the business. But it's wrong to practice usury. General Motors can say that they've paid back the debt in five years because they have gotten more of you and I into debt in order to pay off their debt so they're free, rich, and we're enslaved again. And now the bill collectors are going to keep coming to your and my home, repossessing our vehicles, going and locking up your, our bank accounts because we don't want to go with a pre-owned car and own it. We always want to go new. And then you buy the car for 40000 but pay them back 65000 at the end of the deal. Hmm. Hey, it's worth less than that. The science of warfare. Brothers and sisters, we don't have time to go into it, but you just count the number of black businesses that we have already owned that are no longer black businesses. That white folks have come through their warfare techniques and have taken over just about every major black business that we once owned, Dr. Daniels. You heard the minister talk on this very well. We no longer have them. So what do we have? You're looking at BET, but Viacom controls BET. That's not us. So you upset with some black folks in the front, but it's the white folks that's behind. And it's not about them being white or their skin color. It's what they think in their skin color that we have a problem with. It's not about us being black and being inferior. It is that we think we're inferior because we're black when God really wants to put you on the top of civilization. The Science of Mating. God helped me finish one of the first books on relationships because, brothers and sisters, we go into hell in a gasoline jacket. <laughs> because I've been around a whole lot of intellectuals, a whole lot of smart people, people off the street. We dress well, but at the end of the day, we're nothing but whores and pimps of one another in a suit and a fine dress, and messing up our family life, which interrupts business. How can you talk about entrepreneurship without a stable, functional family life? How can we talk about family legacies in business, and we destroy the family? Now you got to go into divorce court and split up everything. You haven't even gotten your assets yet. You run in a restaurant. If it's large, it takes at least three years to make a profit. You done got divorced in a year and a half. So you cutting into the profits, have not made no profits, so the restaurant closes down, family breaks up, children get put in a, a welfare system. Come on, brothers and sisters, we got to wake up. One thing is connected to the other. America has let us go. When are we going to let them go? I'm going to say something to you that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said yesterday to a packed audience at Union Temple Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. He said, God is after you, black man and woman. He's after you to bring you to take the bottom rail and bring it to the top. He's after you to take the least and make it the most. He's disturbing your grave. He says, we have no jobs. So 50% unemployment among black males. What percentage among females? Add that to it, to the black family. The minister said, we have, there are no jobs, and he said that there are going to be no jobs because God is tired of us being ignorant. He's tired of us being foolish, 
and he's tired of us waiting for others to do for us that which we must come together and must do for ourselves. He is tired of us begging. You have it in your scriptures. Lazarus at the table of the rich man begging for the crumbs to come off, not a slice of bread. That's the black man in America. As intelligent as we are, we can tie together our resources. We can go and grow our tree, cut it down. We can make our own yeast, grow our bread. Take the tree, make the table. Take the yeast, make the bread. Eat at our own table and eat our own crumbs and don't have to beg no one for nothing. When are we going to think like that now? See, not much a hand clap on that because it's critical thinking. The only thing I came here to offer you today on this subject is divine guidance. That's the only currency that I have. Because that which is in our pocket that we use as a means of exchange has no value whatsoever. Not backed by gold or by silver. So remember when you talk about entrepreneurship, it's not about these dead presidents. That if the Middle East decides to take their money off the American dollar and turn it into the euro dollar or the petrol dollar, America would fall immediately. If the Chinese government calls back the over $300 billion that America owes her. That's why President Obama or the office of the president has to be so kind to China because we are in debt to China. And they can send over inferior products yet know how to make superior products. We are a debtor nation. So what we have is just a means of exchange. So we fighting and killing over a debt president and a greenback that doesn't represent anything except when you go get land. So I'll leave you with this. We need to invest in urban and suburban agriculture. Hmm? Land is our freedom. The more we remain landless, then we remain a slave. We need freedom. How many of you in here own a home? Or you paying a mortgage, all right? How many of you in a place where you got a backyard that you control? few more hands went up. How many of you ain't got no backyard at all? How many of you know a family member that got a backyard? How many of you know a best friend that got a backyard? Okay, and they're not doing nothing with it, right? So you want to deal with entrepreneurship? Let me ask you a question. How many of us in this room think we're really free? Okay, we're partly free, but we're not, really, we're not totally free. Right now, if the store closed down, can you feed yourself? I, let me just be honest. I couldn't feed myself right now. I'm still going to stop and shop. Oh, yes. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to sit up here and tell you now. I have the answer to it, but I have to fully activate the answer. Now I'm getting ready to do it. Me and my wife went and got a home out in the suburbs, not because I wanted to get away from the city, because I'm Brooklyn born. Born in the Ville, Brownsville. Never ran, never will. From the sty, do or die. All of that stuff. But we have been taught from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that we need to go to the land. So now we've been there five years now, ain't went to the land yet. This came up, that came up, that came up. Now we about to starve. When are we going to go to the land? So now we're getting ready to build a hoop house. Write that down, H-O-O-P, hoop house. Go on the internet, like Dick Gregory said, and research everything on hoop houses. Why? Because you cannot grow fruits and vegetables in the winter time, but if you build a hoop house, which you can build for nearly $1,000, you can grow food even in 10 degree weather. That's a part of business, of feeding ourselves. Aren't you tired of going to the fruit markets and seeing everyone else having the fruit other than us? Can't we grow grapes? Can't we grow bananas? Can't we grow tomatoes? Can't we grow potatoes? Can't we grow squash? Can't we grow strawberries? Can't we grow string beans? Can't we grow asparagus sprouts, Brussels sprouts? I mean, do you understand what I'm talking about? Or oh, we too busy got our mouth in Kentucky Fried Chicken and Burger King and White Castle. Talking about white folks, they got the better food. Well, they're growing the better food. What are we going to do? 
Many black farmers, but what about us right here? The food can't get to us unless we have a way of transporting it. At Muhammad Mosque number seven, we practice urban agriculture with organic food from black farmers in Detroit. But we've been instructed, you got to get your food grown right where you are. So we're going to start growing food. So if you see me this time next year, God willing, with the help of God, with the resources to do what needs to be done, I can come and bring you some fresh food and vegetables on your table. What are you going to do? Then if we all bring it in the room and the people, while well, people are hungry, we can feed our people. Instead of waiting for others to come and feed us, we would have died off by then, brothers and sisters. So if you want to re-energize the entrepreneurial spirit, the only solution we have is to go for ourselves. Stop complaining. Stop relying. We're going to need now to organize in our neighborhoods and turn them. The Gregory was right. It's not a community yet. It's a neighborhood. That could be a community and make our neighborhoods communities. Since we're all living together, we're all here with one another, we have to find a way to work this out with one another. Then we'll stop praying on one another. Then we can give a solution to the gangbangers who's gangbanging and rather than dealing in drugs, in warehousing of women, children, foolishness, now we can actually look at building an actual community that is reflective of the spirit of the creator, of God himself. He's after us, brothers and sisters, and he's forcing us today to get our mouths out of the house of our open enemy who does not love us. Though we became the burden bearers of this country to build it, we now today have to find ourselves bringing the greatest solution inside of this house. President Obama, brothers and sisters, long before he was elected, he was duly selected by a group of people for the time. But now, while they were already militias in America, they have increased now tenfold. What does President Obama being in office show to us? He's just another pharaoh that's over Egypt telling the children of Israel to make brick without straw. It's not his fault. He inherited it. But what it shows is black excellence. He the president governing this country, black staff helping to run the country. What does that show you? It shows, my dear Deus, that we can govern ourselves. It's ironic. I think Brother Kevin left. It's ironic that we would talk about Black Wall Street, but never want to ever see another Black Wall Street. You don't want to see Black Wall Street come back? We just want to see us on a strip on Jamaica Avenue, Archer, a few businesses here and there, Notion Avenue in Brooklyn, Fordham Road in the Bronx. That's it. We don't want to actually see us come back again in our own Communities, even if it is in the housing facilities called projects. I've been in some homes in the projects when I was growing up. Man, you didn't know you was living in the projects. You went up in there, man, the carpet was about this high, about this thick. Plus, you put your feet in it, you don't see it no more. I mean, they had laid out stuff, man. Long before they put these lifestyles of the rich and famous on TV, we've been living ghetto fabulous in the projects. Only when we got broke then. And everything started turning around. So I'm saying to us in the best spirit this morning, if we really want to re-energize the spirit, we're really going to have to pool our resources with one another. Right now, tonight, if you want to go into business tonight, if I ask every one of you to take out a $100 bill, would you do it? And if you had any trust in me, give it to me. Now, I'm not going to abscond with your money, though I could use it, but I wouldn't run away with it because that would be creating distrust. We take the money. Who here has the best business plan? Who here has the best feasibility study? Who here has the ability to put the business in the right area of traffic that will bring the return that's needed for reinvestment for the next business plan? 
And when this business plan gets off the ground, it employs 20 of us in the room. That's 20 of us that we've put to work. That's how you pool your resources. Not just keep putting it into a black hole and get nothing back in return. These are tangible solutions. May seem simple. Common sense and simple mathematics. But brothers and sisters, common sense and simple mathematics can rule the world. You don't need great trigonometry and algebraic equations for this. All we need is the right courage and the trust of one another. Whatever the case is with Willie Lynch, whether it was 300 years ago or whether it was done in the 60s, the bottom line is whoever wrote it, we are actually fulfilling the parts. And that's the problem. So we need to break the spirit of Willie Lynch. And those of you need to go online and get it and print it out and study it. Because too many young hands have not read Willie Lynch and we play right into it and play against one another. Another subject for another time. So I thank you for having me here. I'm honored to be here with these that have been here today. But brothers and sisters, on behalf of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and serving this family here at York College, I say to you, stop relying on others to do for us that which we must now come together and provide for ourselves. Otherwise, the poverty is going to get worse. The blight is going to increase. And I'm telling you, those of you who have family members who are in prison, if they have reformed themselves, let them back home. We're going to have to learn how to live with one another. Them children that you didn't want no more, and them rooms you done converted into something else, you're going to have to clean them out, and you're going to have to bring your family back in together because that's the time that we are living in today. And if in our unity is our strength, then brothers and sisters, we then can accomplish anything you want. Up, you mighty nation. Because a race has a beginning and an ending. Up, you mighty nation. You alpha and omega. You can accomplish what you will. Thank you as we greet you in peace. Thank you, my dear brother. Let us give all of our panelists another round of applause. And I thank each and every of you, all of you, for coming out tonight. If, um, if you need anything at all, please see the York College Mail Initiative Program. We're in room 3, 3 mo 2 in the main building. If you want a copy of this uh, DVD in the future, just please come to us and we'll be able to get a copy of it for you. Uh, we, we're out of time, so that's it. God bless you. Have a great night. <laughs>